Thanks. All right, welcome to the Amherst Massachusetts Conservation Commission meeting of September 14th, 2022. Um, top of the meeting, comments from the chair, that's me. Usually I use this time to just talk about the meeting we have. Um, our agenda is really full. Um, we've had a bunch of hearings just stacking up. We've had a few continuances since the agenda, so um, it's not, there aren't as many hearings, but we have a lot of other business. Um, so we need to keep this like efficient and succinct um, and really stick to kind of our normal rules. Um, I think what we should do is, uh, of course, any um, reporting from Dave and our land management updates, and then I'll take a minute after that to talk about kind of procedure for the hearings and update it. Um, kind of make a general announcement, Aaron, of um, what we're thinking about in terms of how to make sure our permits are complete <laughs> at the beginning of meetings, just so folks um, have a heads up about that. What I will say before we start into the land management updates is um, for those attendees here, we're continuing the notice of intent scheduled for 730, which is SWCA for 52 Fearing Street, and the request for determination for seven scheduled for 735. That's Keith Morris on behalf of New England Central Railroad. Um, the rest of the hearings we will have some discussion on. So if you're here for 52 Fearing Street or the New England Central Railroad hearings, we will not discuss anything. Those hearings are going to be continued into our next meeting, which is September Wednesday, September 28th in two weeks. Um, so our first hearing, we have to open a public hearing at 740. And probably until then, we'll be discussion, discussing um, land management updates. OK, that's what I had. Dave? Sure. And yeah, I'll, I can elaborate on things or I can go as quickly as, as you'd like, Jen, you just let me know. But yeah, um, there's a lot happening out there. You know, it's, it's still field work season as much as we all, you know, certainly want to extend the, um, the summer. Uh, it's been nice to get some rain. I'm sure all of our streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, all the critters and all of our aquifers really appreciated what we got. We still need more. But um, we're down to Brad and Tyler at this point. Our, our summer staff have gone back to other things, college, uh, et cetera. So it's really just the dynamic duo out there doing as much as they can before the snow flies. And, and really, we've got a lot on our plates. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, field management going on right now. Um, we're really trying to focus on some of the fields that haven't been mowed in years. Um, they just completed Atkins Flats, which is one of our largest um, uh, conservation areas and an area that we'd really, we've really kind of lost um, uh, grassland bird habitat there. So we're really trying to bring that back and get bobolinks to use that area again. We did have um, successful nesting of kestrels there this year, which is really exciting. Kestrels have not been doing well over the last 10 to 15 years. And um, we're going to kind of uh, reach out to Kestrel Trust. I already have, uh, they do a lot of focus on uh, work on kestrel boxes and management. So Hope to work with them this winter and kind of come up with a better plan for where we're encouraging kestrels. Um, the, the, the guys will then move on to South Amherst conservation areas. They're already up at Mount Pollux. They'll move to Wentworth Farm. They'll move to Westover Meadow. Um, still some bridge work being done. David Mullins, if you know David Mullins, a prominent member of our community, he's been really helpful. He's, he's quite a skilled woodworker and he and Brad and Tyler and many volunteers have been um, combining to uh, do some work on trails outside of wetland areas or on uh, bog bridging that was already approved by the commission and permitted by the commission last year or earlier this year. So you'll see some new uh, bog bridging going in, mostly replacement bog bridging. Um, let's see, staying with the theme of bridges, um, Amethyst Brook Bridge, um, it's a tough one. Uh, we are we 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 are really kind of doing a little bit of a pause. I'd really hope that that bridge would be under construction this year. I think it's unlikely. We we really had the town engineer and the building commissioner take a look at our plan, which was approved by the commission, 
And they both, uh, working with Aaron and myself out in the field, really had some pretty significant questions about whether that was the right design structurally to withstand water and ice shearing and last for the next 30 years. So uh, we're leaning heavily on our building commissioner, Rob Mora, who has an extensive background in construction. And, and Rob is kind of due with, with kind of a, a, a redo of that design. And, and likely we would have to bring that back. I don't think it'll be dramatically different, but we will have to bring that back through the commission to see um, how it differs from the plan you all uh, approved. So Amethyst Brook Bridge is, is a little bit of on a hold right now. Other bridge work, um, we do have a new quote, temporary bridge at the KC Trail off of Southeast Street. Um, I'd like to say I'm 100% pleased with it, but I have some questions about that bridge too. So we're, we're gonna take a second look at that bridge. Um, I'm gonna be meeting with the adjacent landowner to talk about that bridge uh, is for pedestrians only. If you've been on it, it's quite robust, I would say. Um, turned out a little more robust than I thought it would be, honestly, um, which translated into a little more cost. Uh, but, you know, uh, the funding is there. So, um, and we can always, if we change the design slightly on that, we do need to add things like... Um, uh, handrails to that and things of that sort. So we've been working with the town engineer and the building commissioner on that. So stay tuned on that. Keep in mind that that is temporary, if you will. I say temporary probably last a couple of years because we we do want to fully explore that bridge as a vehicular bridge as well because it provides access to the adjacent farm uh, landowner for their field in the back. Um, that is a major expense for the town, and I'm still kind of putting together a funding package for that. So I'll be meeting with the adjacent APR landowner and talking that through. In the meantime, we'll see what we're going to do with that very robust bridge, which is now fully functional, but um, um, we're looking at, at, at that structure a little bit as well. Um, so KC Trail Bridge, uh, Amethyst Brook Bridge. Um, what else is going on? Um, we're going to talk about Vista Terrace and the land uh, the uh, gift of land later, I think, in this meeting. Um, uh, I wanted to bring the, to, to your attention a couple of things happening um, next week. I think Aaron may have already sent this to you, but on 920 next Tuesday at 4 p.m., we're doing the ribbon cutting for the Fearing Brook project down at the Fort River Farm. I hope some of you will be, all of you, if you can make it to that. We'll also be dedicating the community gardens there. Um, we're working with a, a very committed group of uh, gardeners who have organized um, part of that event and, and certainly the gardens themselves. And so uh, on 920, that's next Tuesday, the 20th of September, we'll be dedicating those two projects. Um, on 924, which is the following Saturday, the Fort River cleanup happens at uh, Gruff Park and all up and down the watershed. I'm sure perhaps you've gotten some notice of that through uh, Brian Yellen and other folks at the Fort River um, watershed group. Let's see, on October 8th, another Saturday, 9.30 in the morning, um, we'll be rededicating the, the Dickinson Trail. This is the project that the commission uh, permitted with QR codes and new kiosks. So that'll be on uh, Saturday, October 8th at 9.30 in the morning. And again, that, that event will be at Groff Park. So that'll be an exciting, you know, there'll be a new populated kiosk. There'll be the QR code um, um, uh, posts out in the woods following the Fort River, et cetera. So that should be good. Earlier, just a few minutes ago, someone asked about Conservation Commission appointments. Um, Paul Bachman has uh, with with Aaron and with Jen has has done the interviews for those. We had three very qualified candidates. Two of those have been selected uh, with with input from Jen and Aaron. And Paul Bachman will announce those on Monday night, the nineteenth, which is uh, coming up um, just next week. So we have ribbon cuttings, mowing. Um, those were the main things. We're going to talk about Vista Terrace gift in a few minutes. I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, I know that Laura is on the Solar Bylaw Working Group. And, you know, I just encourage the commission to keep an eye on, on the workings of, 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 excuse me, the, yeah, the, the meetings of that group, of that working group. I think they're doing great stuff. 
Um, we are simultaneously also starting the solar siting study um, uh, that's headed up by Stephanie Ciccarello. Stephanie, by the way, I, I should announce, is now our sustainability director, not uh, coordinator. Uh, she has been promoted to that position, and that was announced on Monday night. So, um, so yeah, a lot of exciting things happening both in the field and in committee. Um, lastly, I will say one other ribbon cutting we'll be doing in October to be announced will be we'll be doing the ribbon cutting for solar at the landfill at the North Landfill. And I'll invite all of you because we'll be celebrating kind of three projects at once, the solar on the landfill, the conservation restriction on the South Landfill, which is primarily for grassland birds. And then of course the dog park, we already had a, a grand opening for the dog park. So, but that's a, a wonderful kind of win-win-win uh, dog park on landfill, uh, habitat for grassland birds and solar for the town. And we are the off taker for 100% of that um, that solar power on the, the North Landfill. So, so that's just kind of a smattering of the things that are on my plate and Aaron's plate and, and our land management team and conservation team. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dave. It looks like Michelle has a question. Yeah, just real quickly, Dave. Um, our our last meeting, you mentioned the mowing schedule and and um you know, maintaining late season pollinator habitat. And this just comes because I was uh, visiting Vermont and at the wildlife openings there, and they're just chock full of goldenrods and late season asters. And I was wondering if you had considered sort of a prioritized mowing schedule, not just like, uh, I know Atkins Flat has habitat for birds. Um, so that has to be done, you know, in the, at the end of the season, but if there were, places like Atkins Slats, it could be at the, like sort of the end of the line for mowing to support migrating monarchs and, and other pollinators that are relying on late season asters. And I just mentioned um, Atkins Slats because it has such a, has such a great plant community and I assume it's, it's pretty buzzing. Um, yeah, I just, I'm just throwing that out there as sort of a consideration or whether or not you Consider yeah, that. no, it's a great question, Michelle, and one we grapple with a little bit and, and happy to kind of dig deeper into it. Um, I think our fundamentally, and, and again, we can continue this conversation in more detail, but fundamentally, um, I think time is, is not really our friend. And so we have about 300, 250 to 300 acres of early successional habitat. And given weather, tractor, staffing, um, there's just no way. So we, we have kind of a, a rotational um, schedule for that work. And as an example, Atkins Flats has gotten extremely woody because we've missed it a couple of years. It's very wet. And so actually our tractor got stuck on, in Atkins Flats twice, even though this is before the rain. We got stuck twice down there and had to be pulled out once. We also popped two tires down there because it had gotten so woody. So the challenge for me practically is how, you know, when do we do this mowing? Um, I do get a lot of feedback from, um, from um, the pollinator community. And my response is typically of the, of the you know, 250 or so acres, we normally don't get to you know most of it until mid October to November. But if it snows early November, then we've lost the entire most of the mowing season. So I'm 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 happy to talk more. But we're balancing grassland birds, pollinators, and turtles all at the same time, um, because you know for instance with wood turtles and box turtles, we're trying to avoid the areas that we know for the most part that we know uh, is estimated in priority habitat for them. So I'm you know, open to you know, kind of more systematic way of doing that. Um, I think what it would take is actually doing a more in-depth habitat and botanical study of each one of the fields and then kind of doing a matrix of what are we, you know, more specifically, what are we trying to manage for? Um, yeah, I totally appreciate the logistical complications of that. I just, and probably the pollinator community can weigh in and, or maybe volunteer on the habitat assessments. But and yeah, I, would, I, you know, ideally, if we could, I would wait till November 1st mm -hmm. or November 15th. But realistically, there is no way we will, we will brush hog even 
50 acres typically by the time it snows and then we're done. And then we can't come in early because early migrants, particularly birds, are here in the second week of April. So it's a, it's a conundrum. Um, so um, for instance, this year I know we're also, we're kind of laying off Amethyst Brook because I know there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of milkweed there and we're getting, you know, people care deeply about, as you said, migrating monarchs, for instance. Um, so we're, we're simply laying off, um, we did an early season mow at Amethyst Brook and probably won't even get there until next year. We'll just leave it as is. So, but happy to talk more about that with you anytime. Okay. And one thing I'm just going to say for like public records, I can or send it to Aaron. There's a, a, a new UMass solar, um, siting assessment applicable to Amherst. So I can send, it, it's very new and it's like, um, spatially explicit. So I'd like to pass that on to Laura and I'll, I guess I'll send it to Aaron later, but just want to make people aware of that. Who did that, Michelle? Um, I wish I could give you more information because it's my friend, Zara. <laughs> I don't know her last name, but she, she's, she's a PhD at UMass. So she's like a, she's a researcher there with a specific working group. Um, okay. Maybe, are you already familiar with it or? I think she's probably under um, Dwayne uh, Breger, who's one of the who's the chair of the working groups. Okay, so maybe um, that's redundant team, information. But but pass around anyway. So I think it's always good. Yeah. The let me let me just close, and I know we got to move on, Jen. Uh, on the field mowing, the other factor in our in our spreadsheet, if you will, our matrix is is feedback from users. So so many people, both abutters, um, dog walkers birders, uh, supporters of pollinator habitats, supporters of turtles, oftentimes kind of want to advocate and say, well, why, why are you mowing this? Why aren't you mowing it? Why aren't you mowing it more frequently? It's too woody for bobolinks. So how do we how do we navigate that and how do we defend our choices? That's it's a conundrum. And, and, and again, I would welcome input on um, um, perhaps a better way to do that. But we do have to think about those human users as well and say, you know, you know, what do they want as a butters to these conservation areas as, uh, in addition, so. So actually something to think about, Dave, and because uh, just because of staff timing, obviously is really hard. I, I know you guys have done mass wildlife um, habitat grants before, and I don't know if you could maybe apply for that for biomonitoring or something to help set up a plan. Like maybe you could hire somebody out contractually to do something like this to kind of help kind of have a plan that's there for you guys unless you got you know I don't know might be might be worth looking at into just because I know staff time is so it's so tight yeah so that could be something that could be funding sources out there to actually maybe help what uh, Michelle is referring to and trying to trying to help time all those places we're just trying to think about the two people's time out there doing it so yeah. something to think about and think about a six foot wide um brush hog that's yeah the bat uh, ones that's that's how wide your your mower is so yeah mm -hmm. but happy to have to explore that more and and uh, think about you know a, a an overall plan for that great thanks um any more questions for dave on those things those items um so dave we, you are on also in land management updates for the gift of land, which I think I know what it was, but I'm not quite sure. Do you want to just cover that quickly and then we can? Sure. I think Aaron may have a slide or two, um, context slide to start with. So, so very quickly, um, we'll just roll into these slides. Um, uh, probably five years ago, um, we started a conversation with a developer um, who had purchased a piece of property off of 116. Uh, this is adjacent to the Plumbrook Pond and, and the Kestrel office and our land on the Mount Holyoke Range in South Amherst off of Bay Road. Um, that developer was very open uh, to the possibility of they were planning to, to build um, six or eight houses. Um, we saw this as a very, uh, they were required to set aside some of the land as subdivision open space. And normally um, in this day and age, I don't encourage the town accepting subdivision open space. 
Um, and this is the layout. You can see the circles represent the, the, the new houses and there are a couple of ex existing houses. And this is just beyond Atkins on the left. Vista Terrace is the new street. It's a private way. It will not be a public way. It's coming down from the notch on your right. In any event, the, the land, and I think there's the next slide might be a context map to show this parcel in, in relation to the, um, to the um, um, Plumbrook Pond. Um, we'll Sorry, I didn't get a chance to put them in any slide form, but I have the images here. It can be made a little smaller. Oh, sorry. It's... Um, so in any event, given the proximity to Plumbrook Pond, the Mount Holyoke Range, we talked to the developer and said, there we go. So you can see the parcel in red. It's just over five acres. It's adjacent to our land, the town's land, conservation land in green. Um, so it provides a great opportunity for a small parking area as well as a trail connection in the future. Um, so the developer agreed to donate that land directly to the town. So at no cost, we would pick up about 5.5 acres. Uh, the developer also built the parking area already. For the most part, it's there. They um, uh, all we have to do is add split rail and um, a kiosk, and then we would permit a new trail connection up uh, to the east to the green, uh, which is part of the, the larger uh, Sweet Alice conservation area. So that's the long and short of it. Um, this goes way back pre, this goes back to town meeting uh, time. I remember making this pitch to um, a variety of committees and boards way back when, and and the commission at the time, uh, four or five years ago, was very much in favor of accepting this gift of about 5.5 acres or so. So um, that's, so I am here requesting that the commission vote to accept this gift. And I think Aaron has the, the, the deed was in your packet as well as the, um, the acceptance. Uh, 5.39, I'm sorry, I thought it was 5.5, .5, but 5.39 acres more or less. Do we want it, to make a movement now or are we gonna wait for questions? Do you have any questions? Cool. Yeah, Michelle, go ahead. Um, so this is the entire deed which I guess I'm just not used to seeing such a short little deed because it doesn't have any like legal descriptions or anything in it. Mm -hmm. But it mentions um, a an easement. Is there going to be a separate easement recorded on this, like for this deed? And I see that it's a quick claim. So I assume that there's maybe some review of PTRs or anything previously just so there's some idea of what, I mean, the property doesn't abut and erode. I don't know what the historic land use is, but um, I guess, you know, if it's a quick claim, I assume there's no other easements on the property already. And, you know, just, no, just thinking through. The, there are no other, um, there are no other easements on the property. This would, and I haven't looked at this in a little while, I'm just quickly, um, this is fairly typical for such a small piece of property that um, we would accept as a gift. It does come with, um, as it says, grantor grants to grantee and its agents, employees, representatives, a permanent easement to pass and repass over Vista Terrace. So vehicles will be allowed to pass um, to the parking area on either you know, uh, passenger vehicles, non-motorized vehicles, or by foot over Vista Terrace to the parking area um, um, in perpetuity. So although it won't be a public road, it's a private road, um, they are granting us that right as well. I guess my only question with that is at some point there'll have to be maintenance done in that parking lot or building with the split rail and the building of the trail. And it does say just passenger vehicles. So I guess my only comment, if this is the full legal document, is that it, it does would allow for service vehicles or larger non-passenger vehicles just to do the maintenance required for the property. 
Yeah, I mean, I can, before the council, I, I can talk to our town council about that. Um, it's an interesting catch. Um, the word passenger, yeah, is a little specific. Um, that could even be amended. Um, I don't think the uh, I don't think the the owner or their attorney would have a a, a big issue with that. Um, yeah, I'm thinking in perpetuity. I mean, could could the future owners of Vista Terrace, which will be a homeowners association, could they say, well, conservation, you can't bring a conservation truck in there, something like that? Is that where you're going, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, might as well just do the the forethought up front rather than have to do it, fight about it later. Mm -hmm. I mean, that if the neighbors don't like construction, they could come back to the deed and say, it's too noisy, you're not allowed to bring a car up here or something. So, you know, just to make sure that there's legal access for the town to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So with that change, I'm sure I can get that changed. Any other questions? Again, we are not, we are quite a ways away from the trail. We would, the trail would require a notice of intent. There's at least one stream crossing. There's an old farm crossing with a culvert. I have not looked at it in a couple of years. So we would put that on the list for the next couple of years of field work and permitting. Okay, so with Michelle's suggested kind of small revision, how do we move forward procedurally? Um, normally somebody would make a motion. Um, uh, okay, but can we vote on it without the amendment? Sure, yeah, you, okay. could, you could vote on it as amended. Okay. As recommended. Okay by the commission. Okay. So I think we're looking for, oh, so we probably have to read this whole thing is what you're saying, Aaron. <laughs> okay. So we're looking somebody to, for somebody to read this um, acceptance and add in, um, where would you add in as amended? Go ahead and do it. Um, okay. Yeah, what do you mean? So, um, but it's a vote for approval, right? Well, I think you have to read this and then we vote. Okay, acceptance by the Conservation Commission on this 14th day of September 2022, the Town of Amherst acting by and through its Conservation Commission pursuant to the authority granted by General Law uh, Chapter 40, Section 8C hereby accepts the property located on Vista Terrace Amherst from Applebrook West LLC for open space and passive recreation purposes under the provisions of general law, chapter 40, section 8C. And so I think we're looking for a motion to accept. Motion to accept. Second. Second from Fletcher and we'll do a voice vote. Uh, Laura? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm also aye. All right. Yeah, Thanks, thank you, Anna. And that's a good catch. I will I will work with the two attorneys to make sure, yeah, that passenger passenger vehicles is a little certainly more specific. And we want to just make sure that at some point. As Michelle said, you know, they, you know, 10 years down the road, the, the, the residents don't say, hey, you can't come in there with a, with a truck to do X, Y, and Z. Or mow or whatever else they don't like. Right. right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Dave. Um, all right. So we have six more minutes until we can open a hearing. Erin, what do you want to prioritize in that six minutes? Um, well, uh, we have a couple land use applications, two pretty basic ones, um, but I also know that um, Laura wanted to talk yeah, about. Let me, let me just quickly, I'll, I'll do my thing and do it in six minutes. I'm like, okay. throw it. 
making myself talk quickly. Um, so if you guys recall a while ago, we gave permission for um, more Amherst resident, like many, many years ago, her, her company to film a, a movie on Mount Pollux. And the, this woman came in front of the Conservation Commission and we were very explicit, if I recall correctly, that yes, it's public land, they use it, but public still needs to have the ability to access the site, um, et cetera. So I took my family up there for a picnic, not even realizing it was that same time. I had a really bad experience. Um, I was, there was a policeman blocking into the road, saying that no one could park there, there was no other parking. I told him that I was, you know, who I, who I was with the Conservation Commission, I intended on going here with my family. He let me park on the side of the road um, and he was turning away other cars. Then I walk up there and was told no fewer than three times that I could not go to Mount Pollux and have my picnic because they were filming a movie. So um, we had our picnic um, way on the side of the mountain, um, but all this to say that um, it really made me question um, because I know other members of the public and this is public land were turned away um, while they were filming. And I understand while you're filming a movie, you need total silence. No one can be around, you can't, you can't, can't do anything. Um, but I think there are other similar events where we're allowing people to use public land um, really for private events. Um, and, and the public really is limited um, just given the nature of certain sites. So I was talking with Aaron about this and I think there's a number of paths we can take here. Um, one of my suggestions, and I have no idea if this is even legal. So I wanted to ask you, Dave, this before we even get into this discussion. Obviously we could say as a conservation commission, we're no longer gonna permit certain activities on our lands. Okay, that's option one. Um, and I think about weddings and things like that. A wedding on Mount Pollux, no one's gonna go up there from the public, you know, during that time either. Second option is um, essentially, I think I would suggest that in general, whenever we're, whenever there's a, a, a special use permit um, filed for this, any type of event like this, that there's, I suggest there should be a filing fee because it takes time and you know discussion. And um, but for for events like that, filming event, for-profit commercial events. And I couldn't find any precedent in the state of Massachusetts. I looked and maybe Dave, you have more information, but um, one way to do it would be to basically list out our conditions and to have these commercial, um, whatever, um, you know, group pay some sort of deposit. And if they don't fulfill those, and this is, it, listen, it's opening up a whole, whole, Pandora's box, okay? But if they don't adhere to those conditions, we keep the deposit and we use it to fund the pollinator discussion we were just talking about, Michelle, or wh whatever that is. Um, I come at this from a commercial perspective, you know, I'm in the, I, I, I'm in the you know, <laughs> the, the commercial market. So that's how I approach problems. And I, and I think like a deposit would be enough of a deterrent for people to not say, make false statements in front of the Conservation Commission um, because, you know, that filming event was entirely false. Um, you know, it was, you know, it was, it was pretty discouraging. Um, so I don't know if now's the time for discussion or. Um, yeah. Um, maybe yeah, I like, plant the seed, then we talk about it later. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say. Contemplated. Um, I'm sorry that that happened. I, the conflict aside, I think channeling kind of that experience and this continued trouble we've had with navigating these permits yeah. into our land use policy is probably the most constructive way to go. Um, so yeah, so I made comments to that, but, okay, but, but I, think, I think before we like, and maybe I actually don't know, I don't think this is the right time because we do have a hearing, but like, I would be curious to hear from Dave what is permitted and what is not permitted. 
Um, uh, and that was, you know, because my comments are along the lines of the suggestion I put forth. Um, and I know the intention is to have our land use um, sort of policy finalized by the end of October. So I don't know if the next step is just to review that language and kind of have a live document going back and forth, but. Yeah, I think if I followed it correctly, I think I'm the outstanding and also the last commissioner to look at the land use policy. Everyone else has looked at it. Um, Me too. Oh yeah, you, you have not yet, Dave, right? Yeah, right. so maybe that, if it's okay with you, Laura, we can certainly come back to this at the end of the hearings too, if that makes sense. Um, because I appreciate how tricky this is and like, oh, yeah. no, I feel like we need to figure, figure sure. out how to navigate this. Um, maybe what we can do is, I know you put your comments in, I'll pick it up next and really take a good look at it. Um, think about it a lot. I have to think about this. Um, it's tricky. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, and then go to Dave and maybe in our next meeting under the land use updates, we can have an agenda item for more discussion. Um, if that's okay, Dave. I think that sounds great. Yep. Okay. Dave, would you be available on that the 28th? Yes. Okay. That'd be fine. okay. okay. Um, yeah, let's, let's do that. And if we feel like we need to come back to this at the end of the hearings, um, we can, but I think we should start the hearings just because. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay. So, ooh, I wonder where my, now realizing I have no idea where my like opening of a hearing language is. I might be able to find it for you um, just because I looked it up recently for, for Fletcher. Um, is a chance it's where it should be. I have it if you need it. I can pull it up if that's helpful. Got it. Found it. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Sorry about that. So Let's get this one going. This is um, a notice of intent for the Town of Amherst Department of Public Works for the replacement of a previously failed pedestrian bridge within the right of way of West Street at 371 West Street. Um, so this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Um, Aaron, do you know who was the yeah. answer? Yes. Yep, it should be Paul Dethier, and I think I see him, so I'm going to promote him to panelists. Oh, Andre, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, we did have uh, something on general procedure for fairness to applicants in uh, for the hearings. Is that something we were going to? Yeah. Um, I'm anticipating that this one will. Well, fair enough. Um, so why don't I get take a minute and give a brief reminder of our. Um, procedure for these hearings. Um, so just uh, for everyone in attendance for all of our hearings tonight, um, because we have so much on our agenda and so much to get through um, and cannot be here all night long, um, our general procedure so that we can be fair is that each hearing has about 20 minutes on the agenda. Our general guidelines are that we do a five minute presentation from the applicant or representative, five minutes of comments from town staff. Um, usually that's like pictures from site meetings or a review of the plans. Uh, five minutes for public comment total. Um, if there's more than the number, there's more people than five minutes, then we try to stick to two minutes per person and I will politely cut people off. Um, and then five minutes for commissioner questions and discussion. Um, so that's what we're going to stick to tonight to keep things moving. Uh, if you, I'll, I'll make an announcement, um, about this, but, uh, if you are here as a member of the public for public comment at the top of your comments or questions, um, if you could please, 
uh, identify yourself and give your address just so that um, since because of the zoom format I'm actually Aaron and I are actually the only ones who can like see names and since you can enter any information when you log in we don't have any actual identifying information about the people making the comments um, so if you can do that that's great. The other announcement I was going to make while I have everyone's attention is that one thing we're going to start moving closer to is a very detailed checklist for um, permit applications um, as they're submitted so that if you submit an application, you have to make sure that the application meets all of the items, um, achieves all of the goals, meets all the items on this checklist because Lately, we've been having trouble with getting applications that are not fully complete, um, and then the applicants somewhat relying on town review to get to full completion from the standpoint of meeting um, requirements of the Wetlands Protection Act and the Amherst bylaw. And what that does is um, kind of railroad our meetings, um, spending time reviewing things that aren't really ready for review, and it takes staff um, and commissioner time that we otherwise don't really have. Um, we're super busy, so we need to find an efficient way to continue to move through these hearings. Um, so those were the two things I wanted to say at the top of the hearings. I should also note um, that we are continuing the notice of intent um, for 52 Fearing Street and um, continuing the request for determination of the New England Central Railroad. Uh, so now we're at our 740 agenda item is the notice of intent um, for the town of Amherst Department of Public Works. I think I covered it. Was that, Andre, was there anything else? Thank you for the reminder. No, I was just going, yeah, I was just going off of what, uh, what was on uh, our PowerPoint and uh, you covered it uh, in an awesome way. Okay, awesome. Um, so who are we gonna bring in? I promoted Paul to a panelist. Um, I don't know if it's just taking a little while. Uh, oh, there he goes. Okay, he's coming in. Uh, hello, this is Paul from the uh, Amherst Department of Public Works. Um, so I actually I'll try to keep this brief then. Um, I wanted to share my screen if that was possible. You should be able to, Paul, if you have any trouble, let me know. Okay. Yeah, you are, you are so, a panelist. You should be able to share your screen. Actually, I don't see that anywhere. Like in the bottom center of the screen, do you see a share screen option? Yep. Okay. How's it? Can you guys see that picture? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Photograph. All right. Um, so, what what this project is is there's there was an existing pedestrian bridge located over the Plum Brook uh, that served as a connection for the existing paved sidewalk on the western side of of West Street, which is Route 116. And the project is the site is at, the actual number is number 371 West Street. And that's a property owned by the town. Um, so the existing metal bridge that was on site uh, was extremely rusty. The beams underneath it were extremely rusty. And what we ended up doing uh, on in back in 2020, Mass DOT deemed that this bridge was unsafe. So the DPW removed the bridge from its abutment and basically put Jersey barriers up and provided a temporary pedestrian route around the, the site. So right now, today, it looks like this. Um, so we've got our, we barricaded off the sidewalk and allowed people to go around uh, on the east side of the, where the bridge used to be. And the pipe in the center is the water main that runs parallel to the roadway. Um, so what we're doing is we're proposing to replace the old bridge with a new 10 foot wide, 18 foot long precast concrete bridge, which is this. And what we want to do is place this direct, it's, we measured this, uh, designed it and had it built specifically to be set onto the existing bridge abutments. Um, so the procedure would basically be, we would go down, we would trim the vegetation off the side of the abutments that grew, uh, 
over the spring. We would trim any large branches over the site itself so we can get a crane in there. Um, and ideally what we would do is have the bridge delivered on a truck, have the crane on site, lift it off, set it in place. We would mark all the mounting points, then lift the bridge off, place it to the south of the project site uh, on the west side of the road where the sidewalk is, and we would fabricate all the mounts. And once those were done, we would lift it back up and set it in place. Um, so the project itself really doesn't have impacts because we're using the ex existing abutments. Um, we're not in the stream. Uh, we're not, I guess, other, other than trimming the vegetation on the west side of the abutments, we're not doing any bank work or anything like that. Um, so that's basically the project in a quick summary. That's a great overview. Thanks, Paul. Erin, did you have any comments or concerns? Um, I don't have any concerns about this. Natural Heritage came back and um, basically said, because there's no excavation, um, there's no groundwork other than just pruning. There's no real vegetation removal. Um, there's no... Um, anticipated impact to the river as far as like debris falling in or anything like that because they're just setting the structure in place. Um, so from my perspective, I don't really have any comments or concerns. I'm also, um, I don't have conditions prepared to um, issue the permit tonight, but um, I think if the commission feels comfortable at, with what's the work that's being proposed, that um, my recommendation would be that we close the public hearing this evening and then I can be prepared um, at the next meeting with conditions so that we can issue the order. I did talk to Paul about that and um, he said that it wouldn't interfere too much with his timeline um, if we ended up doing that. I also have site visit photos from the visit today, which I can share if you guys would like to see. Um, they might be a little more. Um, so would you like me to stop sharing? Um, yeah, that'd be fine. I can okay. just share my screen if it allows me to. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is from the site visit today. So it looks a little different because some of Paul's photos were um, taken in the winter. Just to give you a better sense of like what the veg, veg looks like out there right now. So this is like the pruning that um, Paul was referencing. Some of the, the branches need to be pruned and then some of the, in order for the crane to um, operate and lift it safely, some of the larger branches on the tree that is right over the bridge would need to be pruned as well. Um, this area over here is the area that um, Paul was referencing um, uh, on this side of the um, hydrant to set the bridge temporarily while they fabricate the mounts for it. Um, and so one of the things we had talked about on site today was um, them running erosion controls just all the way down just to make sure that in case there's any ground disturbance from the setting of the bridge there temporarily that that would cover that. Um, let's see. And then that's those these are photos of the existing abutments and then a photo of the river looking downstream. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I just want to see if we have any questions or comments from public attendees at the meeting. Um, so if you're here as a member of the public and have a question or comment about the pedestrian bridge replacement at 371 West Street, um, please raise your hand. Not seeing anyone. Okay, great. Um, commissioners, any questions? Okay, I so Paul, I can look closely at the plans here, but you can probably answer it more quickly than I can sort it out. Is the invert of the bridge, the pedestrian bridge deck below or above the invert of the road bridge deck? That I'd have to look at the photo. It is, well, it is 
probably, I don't know, I can't see a curve in this picture, but I know there is one there. So I would say it's six inches above the grade of the, of West Street. Okay. So we're and, not adding any constriction to stream flow in that area. So it's in kind or no. from where it was. Correct. Correct. Okay. It, um, the new bridge though is probably four inches higher than the existing sidewalk. So part of this project would be cutting the sidewalk back, uh, taking up the, the blacktop, adding gravel to raise the grade up to the deck, the new deck height, and then, okay. uh, then repave up to the bridge. Okay. And Great. the other thing is the existing sidewalk is six feet wide. The bridge is actually 10. So we'll probably pave to eight feet at the bridge. Okay. Okay. Got it. So we're actually gaining more kind of stream cross-sectional area. So that's good. We'll take it. Okay. okay. That was my only question. Um, so I think with that, we need a motion to close the public hearing. Um, and then we would issue an order of conditions in our next meeting. Thanks for your um, understanding on that, Paul. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll make a Maybe motion to, oh, sorry, Michelle, get in there, Michelle, you got it. I move to close the public hearing for 317 West Street. Second. Is that Andre with a second? Yes. Okay, voice vote, Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Laura. Aye. I'm also I. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye. Bye. All right. Okay. Um, Aaron, do we want to go back quickly and actually vote on the continuation of the two earlier hearings? Because we didn't do a motion to continue. Sure. Yeah. If we want to just run through the the motions for the three hearings really quickly, that would be good. And we'll just that way we don't have to worry about forgetting about it later on. Yep. Awesome. Um, these are all scheduled out. So somebody just needs to read the motion for each. All right. I'll, I'll make a motion to move the public hearing. I'm sorry. I make a motion to move the public hearing of 46 Fearing Street, September 28th, 2022 at 740 p.m. Second. That's Michelle in the second. Voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Also an aye. All right, New England Central Railroad. So I'll make a motion to for New England Central Railroad request for termination to move the public hearing to September 28, 2022 at 7.45 p.m. Second. Second for Michelle, voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. I'm also an aye. Um, there's 371. Okay, so um, just really quickly, um, we had a site visit today out on Canton, um, and there are still some additional revisions that are being made to that plan set. Um, so they were going to try to submit the plan set by the end of the day today for us. And I said, we have had that happen to us before and it didn't work out well. Um, you think you need to take some time with your revisions and get them to us um, the Friday before our upcoming meeting. So um, they're working on those revisions. And um, yeah, unfortunately, we have to kick this one down the road too. All right. I'll make the motion uh, to, um, I can't have lot two from those intent to move it to the public hearing to September 28th, 2022 at eight o'clock. Second. Michelle in the second, voice vote, Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And I'm also an aye. Okay, so Canton Ave was our 745, okay, sweet. So we can go ahead with um, Eastman Brook, right? Or Eastman. Did I skip ahead? Uh, Eastman oh, Brook. Here we go, here we go. Got it. 395 West Street. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I, got, I got distracted there. 
Sorry. That's okay. Um, okay. So we've already, this is a continuation. So this is our 750 hearing. Um, a notice of intent SWCA on behalf of Ron Laverdier for the construction of a multifamily residential building and associated site work and mitigation in the riverfront and buffer zone to BVW at 395 West Street. Um, so is this Mickey? Yes, and I yes. sort of had hoped that we were just going to go right into potentially conditions for this, but um, if Mickey has anything closing or if there's any public comment in closing, um, just to let you guys know I'm ready. Okay. Okay, Mickey raised his hand, so I brought him in as a panelist. Uh, no, the, the only thing I would add is that um, the natural heritage folks um, had a condition for uh, a turtle protection plan, and that plan has been approved by natural heritage. Um, so that the, the, the construction has some uh, con turtle monitoring requirements. Okay. Thanks, Mickey. Um, I'm just looking at Aaron for your draft. Okay. So Aaron took a lot of time to do some very detailed and um, really well thought out conditions for this project. Aaron, do you want to run through those? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is there, you know, this is in a draft form, but I tried to sort of get as comprehensive as possible on the special conditions. So we have our standard boilerplate for state and local um, commercial projects, which I'd like to include here. And then there's um, very specific conditions for this site. Um, and I'll just run, really sorry, I'm super tired. So I'm gonna do my best here. Um, Stake straw bales shall be used as erosion controls um, on the entire site where the limit of work is adjacent to resource areas, except as approved or recommended by NHESP. I know sometimes for turtle habitat, they require different. Um, so if natural heritage requires different, then that would supersede this condition. Entire lot is within buffer zone and riverfront area. Only native plantings can be used on the site, including landscaping. Um, no snow storage in resource areas or in stormwater structures. Um, if the site is being accessed from West Street over the existing driveway after the asphalt is removed, a plan must be submitted showing the tracking pad in that area. Um, stormwater O&M log shall be filled out as required for each stormwater structure following the approved stormwater maintenance schedule in the notice of intent demonstrating regular required maintenance. This condition shall follow the site in perpetuity um, and the complete maintenance log shall be submitted with the request of certificate of compliance. Uh, we've recently had some projects submit for certificates of compliance and then when I ask for the maintenance log, they have nothing. Um, so that's why I included that as a condition. Um, and I'm hoping to sort of incorporate that into our standard boilerplate in the future. Uh, any contractor performing work on this site shall be provided with a copy of the order of conditions and shall sign indicating that they've read the order of conditions. I would get their signature when we have our pre-construction meeting. Any contractor that does not install, correct, or maintain environmental controls on site shall be subject to enforcement action and fines. Uh, drainage and stormwater shall be placed at proper grades um, and inverts using survey equipment and shall be overseen by a registered licensed engineer. Uh, mitigation areas, permanent boundary markers shall be placed at the limit of work and restoration areas prior to the start of development activities on the site. Um, options include boulders, split rail fencing, rebar, wetland markers. These markers shall serve as boundaries in perpetuity and will be required to be maintained in perpetuity in the certificate of compliance if they biodegrade. Um, as built plans shall include riverfront and wetland mitigation areas, which shall be conspicuously labeled. Signage shall be installed at visible intervals along the limit of work line um, of the mitigation area. And again, the language of this is negotiable, but wetland area, no mowing, dumping, cutting, something to that effect, or as a language approved by the wetlands administrator or the conservation commission. 
No additional rear front alteration is permitted on this property. Uh, this is an ongoing condition in perpetuity in the order of conditions after issuance of the certificate of compliance. This is because we're at the 10% and over the 5,000 square feet alteration uh, threshold in the regulations. Mitigation areas are considered compensatory mitigation for the approved riverfront alteration and as such no future alteration of any kind is permitted in the mitigation areas. This is an ongoing condition in perpetuity in the order of conditions after the issuance of the certificate of compliance. Turtle protection plan prior to the start of work and HESP shall approve turtle protection plan. I'm going to glaze over that one because they've already gotten the approval from yeah. NHESP. Right. NH, uh, NHESP endangered species biologists with um, expertise in herbicide applications shall review the proposed formulation of herbicide treatment, including surfactant being proposed for use by SWCA or licensed applicator, and approve or modify uh, the herbicide formulation to NHESP satisfaction in advance of the herbicide application. Conservation Commission shall be copied and notified on the NHESP herbicide review and approval process. This condition shall is to prevent adverse impacts to other species of plants on the site, as well as aquatic vertebrates and invertebrates in the treatment area. All chemical treatments will be conducted in accordance with 333 CMR 11.04 sensitive area restrictions. A detailed herbicide treatment schedule shall be submitted to the Conservation Commission for year one and year two prior to the start of development activities on the site. An ongoing treatment schedule shall also be provided for ongoing treatment as an ongoing condition. So I just provided that so that when the permit expires, if they have ongoing treatments that are in their treatment regime, that they're not constricted by the order of conditions and they can continue that treatment as part of the certificate of compliance if needed. <clears throat> um, where did I leave off? Um, some of these are a little bit redundant, so I'll make sure that the redundancies are gone. Um, uh, some that are very restrictions. Yeah, 21. Uh, work on the approved wetland and riverfront mitigation plan must begin within six months of the pre-construction date. This is just to make sure that the mitigation is going um, consecutively with the development on the site. Site monitoring. The owner shall be required to hire a competent professional wetland scientist for weekly erosion and sediment control inspections and monitoring. Inspections shall start immediately following the pre-construction meeting and continue throughout the construction phase until final inspection by the wetlands administrator to confirm stabilization. I'm adding a um, date and sign off by me for the pre-construction and the final inspection. And this is learning process because we've had some situations where I wasn't reached out to for a pre-construction. So I'm trying to tighten that up a little bit. Erosion and sediment control inspections shall be submitted um, by the inspector to the Wetlands Administrator Conservation Commission on a monthly basis. So even though the inspections are happening weekly, the reports only have to come to us on a monthly basis. Contain um, photos of the entire site, uh, the erosion control boundary and recommendation for maintenance and repair of controls. Reports may be submitted in an informal email format. Um, if the reports are not submitted, the site will be considered out of compliance and subject to enforcement action. Quarterly mitigation area monitoring and progress reports. We talked about this at the last meeting because we didn't have a sequence of construction. Again, this is to keep the mitigation area um, implementation moving at the same scope as the construction and development of the site. Um, shall be submitted to the Conservation Commission reports, shall outline work completed on the approved mitigation plan throughout the calendar year. The property owner is responsible for hiring a competent professional wetland scientist to prepare the mitigation area progress reports. Reports must be submitted on a quarterly basis until one, the construction of the mitigation area has been completed and two, the invasive treatments have been underway for a three year period. Upon full completion of the approved mitigation plan, a final report shall be submitted to the Conservation Commission. A certificate of compliance shall not be issued without the submission of monitoring reports and a final report. And then the, the boilerplate would follow. And those are very standard for the pre-construction you know, pre meeting, um, making sure wet, um, vehicles aren't crossing wetlands and so on and so forth, just our general boilerplate. I certainly can't think of anything you didn't cover in there. Um, the extensive, Aaron. Nice work. Yeah. Um, Mickey, was any of that surprise? Are we good to go? Uh, yeah, 
it sounds like a you know a very well put together set of conditions and you know the owner and contractor will just need to make sure they understand all the steps and uh, there's nothing there that's not part of what was in the notice of intent of the plan so it, it's good to see it all written down okay great thank you um commissioners any further comments or questions about this project All right. Michelle, raise your hand. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. I switched um, to the agenda. <laughs> I just uh, have a question about how we would, will in the future evaluate the mitigation quarterly, quarterly reports. Like, are there benchmarks that we would be looking for? And I guess what I'm thinking about is, you know, sometimes things don't move along and like, do we have recourse to push them forward if nothing is happening? I mean, we could get reports um without necessary progress so i i don't have experience on that with this commission but um i do elsewhere so i was just wondering are there a, is there a timeline or are there benchmarks that we would evaluate the reports up, upon so uh, michelle i tried to take that exact comment into consideration here um, with the way that i conditioned this and if we want to delve into it a little bit um so the the incentive here is that the quarterly reports um have to be submitted um <clears throat> until the construction of the mitigation area has been completed that's number one and the invasive treatments have been underway for a three-year period so if they delay on the they're going to be starting the monitoring um within six months of the pre-construction meeting so the idea here is they're going to have to be paying for a monitor to submit quarterly reports and if they delay in the construction of the mitigation area or the invasive treatments, then it's just going to carry over and make this longer, um, you know, in terms of they're going to be paying for a longer period of time for the monitoring. So the idea is here, we want to have the mitigation area constructed while the development is underway and hopefully wrapped up when the development is completed. And that's kind of the incentive. Can I ask a question? Um, do we have like a, what is the, you know, Obviously, our landscapes are changing so quickly. Do we give developers like a timeline for when they need to build? And if they go, like, if they don't start within that timeline, we have to go right back to the drawing board. Well, so if they don't start construction. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, for example, like, think about this neighborhood where I live right now and think about how, you know, you have like, plans to build homes and then you delay for a long time and, and you know, years pass and landscapes change and you know our climate is changing and um, I just wonder like do we have like a, a finite amount of time when someone who you know is required to like build within that timeline otherwise you have to come back to us so uh a permit is applicable for three years. So there's that. Um, generally, like with projects like this one, like the five, there are other drivers involved in pushing the project forward that are far stronger levers than any that we would have from a like suitability of mitigation sure. landscape perspective. So um, with that with that permit like three years though, let's say I mean, I'm just like honestly like a I don't want to get into this in great detail, but like you can extend that. You can keep extending that. You can keep extending that. So at what point do we say, okay, too many extensions before you have to come back to us again and we have to relook at the site because quite possibly in five to seven years, things might have changed. And the reason why I'm asking is that, you know, obviously we all know that like building costs are going up tremendously and projects very well could be delayed. So I'm just, that's just sort of a general question that I have. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, did you have a comment? Yeah. So Laura, I think you, the the project for the community, the area that you live in, is a good example. Um, and I'll just I'll just talk uh, sort of generally about my procedure with something like that. So it seems it seems like 
some commissions just sort of when when an applicant comes in and says, oh, my permit's about to expire, I need an extension, we'll just say, okay, three year extension, no problem. That's not that's not a procedure that I've ever followed. If if an applicant comes in and asks for a three year extension, the first thing um, that we do is so first of all, they have to have the all of the wetland flagging has to still be in existence on the site. I take their plan and I go out there and I check every single flag to see that they're still there. And I also see has anything changed on the site. If anything has changed on the site, they don't get an extension. Um, they have to come back and refile. So I think it really comes down to a procedural question yeah, of how staff that, and the that, commission. That's your procedure, Aaron, which I think is a great procedure. Is that written down somewhere as our procedure? You know what I mean? I mean, every commission should do this when yeah. a, an applicant comes back every, for an extension. Yeah. You know, like that is the procedure. That is the procedure. That is yeah. what is supposed to happen. Some yeah. commissions don't okay. follow it. And to. I don't want to derail us, but this yeah. is. Just, yeah. yeah. I appreciate it, guys. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 I appreciate where you're coming from on that, Aaron. I think in this case, I think we have protections against that in the way that the town operates, Aaron operates, and this commission operates. And I also think it's less relevant for this application and these more commercial applications, but I do see where you're coming from. Um, okay. Michelle, are, do you think, are we okay? Are you um, satisfied with that? Kind of um, yeah, so it sounds like monitoring is built into the reporting time period. So it's not just that they can print out a report with a different date. It's actually tied to some cost incentive. That is that right? Okay, got it. Yeah, because they're paying an, an independent agent to do to, that. To be report. there in person, yeah. not just to write a report. Got it. Exactly. Yep. Fletcher, did you have a question? Okay. All right. Well, in that case, um, let me see if we have any public questions or comments. Um, if you are here as a member of the public um, and have any questions or comments about our um, NOI, Notice of Intent, SWCA for um, 395 West Street, please raise your hand. I don't know who has the crickets chirping, but I hear crickets I literally. There's a cricket like <laughs> like in our window. I feel like it's been keeping me awake. Um, okay, I keep, turning, I keep muting it to see if it's in my house. Sorry, I think it's me. I'm doing the same thing. I'm like, oh, it's, it's just right really there. funny because we, you know, it's like a joke that there's crickets, but there's literally crickets. <laughs> Sorry, it's my cricket. There's been one in our bathroom that we can't find for the past week. Um, all right, I don't have any public comments. So I think we are in good shape to close this hearing. Um, so Aaron, okay, great. Crickets. Uh, I, I know. To, oh, you can have this one, Fletcher. You sure? <laughs> It's not just cricket. It's okay. Uh, I'll make the motion for 395 West Street. The notice intent to move to close the public hearing, issue the order of conditions for 395 West Street with the noted conditions as Aaron previously mentioned. Second. All right. Michelle in the second. Voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Laura. Andre. Aye. I'm also an aye. Thank you, Mickey. Hey, thank you all for all of the time you spent working on this. Appreciate it. Good night, all. Good night. All right. You're muted, Aaron. We got to close at least one hearing. <laughs> I know. Oh my God. <laughs> that was exciting. Um, don't get used to it. So the next two, unless I've lost track, the next two, we're really only gonna have a short presentation from applicant or an applicant's representative and take public comment. But um, because of the multiple factors here, um, we're not gonna have a staff review or comment and we're gonna save commissioner um, questions and comments until 
we are able to hear from Erin on her take on the projects. Right, Erin? Yes, and one of the projects did submit uh, 47 Olympia Drive, which is the next hearing, submitted a revision today. So um, we we weren't ready to do a review of it anyways, so. Yeah, okay. All right, so I guess let's open the hearing for 515 Sunderland Road. So um, this is a notice of intent. Would Massachusetts Incorporated on behalf of BWC East Springbrook LLC and Blue Wave for a proposed 18.87 megawatt AC. Oh my God, Laura, you should read this. Very specific battery energy storage facility in the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at 515 Sunderland Road. Um, this public hearing is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31's Wetland Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaw. Um, is Josh is Josh potentially a representative here of the project, Aaron? Do you know? You're muted. Why do I keep muting myself? I'm not positive, but I'm assuming since he's raising his hand, he must be. Okay. Yeah, if you're an attendee and you are representing this application, raise your hand. All right. Josh, Drew. I know Drew is, but I wasn't sure about the other okay. gentleman. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, yeah, thank you. I can can in fact verify I am uh, representing the applicant. So okay, great. <laughs> so thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, um, great. Um, and Josh, did you hear our just like general hearing mm -hmm. procedure and how we're going to go forward with this? So we're really looking for a five minute overview, and then we'll take any public comments and questions tonight. But we will continue to our next meeting um, for a more substantive discussion once we've had time for staff review, and we'll take commissioner comments at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, so, and, and that made total sense. So um, yeah, I just wanna give a brief overview of the project and uh, you know explain what we're proposing, um, the work, jurisdictional areas, um, and why we're here tonight. So I'll just share my screen and pull up the site plan um, that I'll just kind of use to, to walk through. Um, I also just wanted to note, we do have um, Andrew Vardakis from Wood Engineering, who's, who's our engineer on the project as well. Um, he's on the call in case any I know you said no questions, but in case anything specific to the stormwater analysis or 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 wetland flagging comes up. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> so if everyone can see my screen, so this is a <clears throat> just a high level view of the site plan. Um, just very briefly, Blue Wave. Um, we're historically a, a solar developer in Massachusetts, um, doing projects across the state. Uh, we've recently been uh, getting into developing energy storage projects as well. Uh, one of which is this project we're proposing at 515 Sunderland Road. Um, this is the context here is uh, the state's clean peak program and the, this movement toward deploying energy storage projects across the state. Um, and in particular targeting specific areas where there's higher concentrations of solar or congestion on, on circuits where these products provide additional value to the grid. Um, one of which is, is this circuit um, and location in Amherst. Um, so again, this is 515 Sunderland Road, um, which is just at the, uh, border of Amherst and Sunderland um, to the north. Um, the site currently, and I don't have, apologies, don't have the satellite view, but um, the site uh, is a currently just uh, open uh, field effectively. Um, it's uh, just a, call it grassy area. Uh, the rear of the parcel um, is, a, you know, previously a tilled agricultural area. Um, there was a uh, previously an existing uh, house development um, in the middle of where our proposed footprint is, that since has been demolished. Um, so the site is currently uh, undeveloped. Um, again, it's coming off of uh, Sunderland Road. There is a existing semicircular access uh, road um, that was used for the house that uh, is still in existence. Um, there are three uh, wetland systems that were flagged. Um, this wetland system to the north um, near the property boundary um, here, which is labeled as WB, there's the wetland flags are, are here. I, I have to flip through to see what we exactly call this this system, but um, there's a system to the north uh, 
there's a system to the southwest, um, just kind of, you can see the flags popping up here, um, just off uh, at the edge of the, the layout. And then to the east, we have a uh, perennial stream uh, and associated uh, 200 foot riverfront area. The proposed project uh, is an 18.87 megawatt AC energy storage system. Uh, it would be a four hour uh, battery system. So, um, you know, measured in energy duration, it's approximately, uh, you know, 70, 75 uh, megawatt hours of, of energy storage. Um, the entire development footprint is slightly less than an acre. Um, currently, uh, we're proposing uh, this fence line uh, as you see here, um, is the boundary of the development. Uh, within the development, uh, we would be looking to conduct uh, very minimal grading. It's, it's again, effectively flat if you've ever seen the site. And I know there will be a site visit scheduled, so hopefully most of the commission members will be able to, <clears throat> to visit the site and see it. Um, <clears throat> but it's fairly flat, um, so there will be extremely minimal grading required, if effectively no grading and really just a preparation of the surface for the, the project. Um, the interior, the fence line will be a woven, would be proposed as a seven foot high woven wire fence. The interior of the site would be um, proposed as crushed stone gravel yard effectively, as well as the access road. We would maintain the existing uh, semicircular access road uh, and extend it, as you can see here, coming up toward the north and then a, a hammerhead turnaround with an, with an existing, or excuse me, a proposed access spur coming into the fence line uh, and into the project for access to this to the equipment itself. Um, <clears throat> the equipment uh, located on site would be six concrete pads where uh, inverters, transformers, and electrical switch gear would be located. And then the battery containers themselves, which are uh, lithium ion uh, stationary energy storage containers. Uh, I do wanna point out that uh, you can see here that some of these containers are solid, zoom in a little bit. Some of these containers are solid lines, some are dotted or excuse me, uh, dash lines. The dash lines represent uh, potential units that would in the future be added to the site for augmentation. But uh, on day one or year one, when the site's constructed, um, the only units that would be placed would be uh, the ones outlined in, in solid lines here. Um, so again, over time with every two to three years, there might be a, a couple of units added to augment the system as it degrades over time in terms of its energy capacity. Um, Additionally, there is some proposed vegetative screening uh, along the northern side, western boundary along the road, Sunderland Road, and to the south. Um, currently, we propose you know simple evergreen plantings, arbor varieties. Although we're of course, and in, in hopefully at the future meeting, we'll discuss with the commission if there's preferences on plantings and the types of vegetation used. Um, we're very open to what the town is seeing in other pro similar projects for screening or the types of vegetation they like to see done and used on projects. Um, in terms of the jurisdictional areas and our work within them, uh, of course, each of the wetland systems to the north and the southwest have their associated 100 foot buffers. And then again, the perennial streams to the east has a 200 foot buffer. Um, first, just dealing uh, addressing the stream. So there is the 200 foot riverfront area or buffer extending here where I'm, hopefully you can see my cursor. Uh, our work is entirely outside of the 200 foot riverfront area. Um, we basically just kind of come up uh, tangent to it uh, along alongside the eastern fence line. Uh, in regard to the wetland systems, um, all of our work is entirely outside of the 50 foot uh, no work zone per the town's revised bylaw. When we originally were working on the project, uh, we actually had designed it and then the, the bylaw was changed while we were working on the project. So we did make sure to shift things around and to the best extent possible and make sure we respected that 50 foot no work zone. Uh, on top of that, the majority of the work that's within the 50 to 75 foot work, uh, zone is primarily fence line and plantings. There's a portion of the access road here you can see that does fall within uh, that 75 foot zone. But for the most, but all, all proposed equipment and impervious surface would be outside of the 75 foot uh, buffer as well uh, to the project, which um, we, uh, we feel also helps mitigate any potential impact to, to any of the resource areas. Um, in regard to stormwater, would perform stormwater calculations. So there's uh, actually not that much impervious surface added to the site. There are these six concrete pads that would be proposed. Uh, each of the battery units is supported, but would be supported by a proposed uh, concrete pillar foundation system. Um, so water would still be allowed to uh, infiltrate in between those concrete pillar foundations. 
uh, and flow throughout the site. So in regard to increase in peak flow runoff rates, uh, we're obviously meeting the, the DEP stormwater standards in regard to no increase in those peak flow rates. Um, and again, the actual increase in um, uh, impervious surface is, is very minimal on site. Um, I'll stop there. I think there's probably about five minutes, but um, and I know that's a bit, maybe a little bit, a lot to kind of overview, but that's the, uh, the high level view of the project. The last thing I'll mention is uh, the proposed interconnection of the system is through a series of poles onto the distribution grid along Sunderland Road. And this is running, for those who are familiar with the sites area, uh, to the substation that's very close to the site, just to the south. Um, so it is interconnecting to that substation. So. Okay, thanks, Josh. That was a very thorough and succinct overview, which I appreciate. Um, so I'm gonna open this for public comment. Um, if you're here as a member of the public attending our Conservation Commission meeting and you have any questions or comments about this notice of intent for a battery, battery energy storage facility in BBW at 515 Sunderland Road, please raise your hand. Not seeing anything. All right, um, I, we don't have any hands up. We have 10 people in attendees and in attendance and nobody's raising a hand. So I think we've um, sufficiently allowed a period for public comment. Um, Aaron, would you be willing to share your screen and we can um, do our motion to continue the public hearing? Uh, sorry, I know we're not supposed to ask any questions, but um, if so, we just did a public hearing. So now we're doing a motion to another public hearing, or so there's no more public comment for the next meeting. Oh, we are continuing the public hearing. There will be public just everything. Yeah. Okay. All right. We would close the public hearing and continue. Yeah, that's yeah. A good, that Got is confusing. It. Okay. We could. It's a little confusing, but I, I see what I understand the procedural. I got it. Yeah, so there can be public comment at the next meeting as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll move to uh, continue the public hearing on 515 Sunderland Road uh, to September 28th, 2022 at 7.50 p.m. Second. Second. Oh. Ooh, I think I got Fletcher with the second there. I don't know, it was close. <laughs> Voice vote, Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Uh, Michelle. Aye. Okay. And I'm also an aye. Josh Drew, thanks for being here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And just in terms of logistics, I see the site visit scheduled. Aaron, um, I assume I'll just coordinate that with you. And then are there typically, is that just with Aaron typically, or are there members of the commission who would look to attend? Um, so Aaron notifies the commission and if members can be there, we will be, um, okay. we've been our commission right now. Um, we have a, we have, we struggle to get to, um, to site visits during business hours. Um, so okay. it, might, it might just be Aaron. But okay. The best. other thing I should, should note too, is that we may have two new conservation commission members at the next hearing. So this will make it really easy for them to review the tape so that they could potentially vote on the project. And also they could potentially attend the site visit as well. Okay. And, and with that, are you hoping to have that site visit between now and that next public hearing or sometime after? Yeah. Uh, it would be between now and the next yeah. hearing. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 yeah go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. We can, we can schedule that sort of, um, after the after the meeting offline and i'll make sure that the commission members um are invited and can attend or you know or at least offered the opportunity to attend yeah absolutely and I, I know there were site photos included in our noi but if there's additional photos or videos that we can provide you know and take so that if commission members can't attend they can see the site or see certain areas then we're happy to provide those as well um and uh, and in an era we can just coordinate with you in terms of your review and and when when you want to set up a conversation to talk about the project. Sounds good. Great. Thank you, Josh. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. All right. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Perfect. Thank you. Bye.
Gotcha. I think it's Mark Dad, Nikki, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry. I was so. still messing with the attendees. Um, did you move him in, Aaron? I did. Yes. Okay. All right. So this, we're going to follow the same procedure for this NOI as we did for the one we just finished or we just continued. Um, so this notice of intent is SV Associates on behalf of Archipelago Investments LLC and 47 Olympia Drive LLC for the redevelopment of 47 Olympia Drive, including demolition of existing structure and construction of a multi-story apartment style dormitory associated driveway parking drainage and utilities in the buffer zone to BBW and an intermittent stream at 47 Olympia Drive. Um, so this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended and article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. Okay, Mark, hello. Hello. Um, so did you hear our plan, like our procedure for tonight? Um, I did. Okay. So I'll do a quick overview of the project and then see if there's public comments. Okay, fantastic. Can you, can everybody see the screen? Yep, we see a plan. Um, so the Locust property is 47 Olympia Drive and it was formerly the Chai Omega Iota Beta Chapter House. Um, the parcel is approximately 1.06 acres in size, and it abuts the Wildwood Conservation Area, which is owned by the town of Amos. Um, the wetlands were flagged by Ward Smith of Wetland, um, by Wendell Wetland Resources in January of 2021 and um, located by SV Associates. The proposed project is to raise the existing um, sorority house and remove the existing driveway and garage and back patio and construct a two building um, dormitory structure with a connection between the two uh, with a centralized walkout of the front of the building to Mathers Drive. Um, stormwater will be collected within the um, courtyard area and collected in nyloplast drains and funneled to or directed to the um, municipal system in Mathers Drive and the roof um, drain or storm model will be collected into retained systems um, that are located on the eastern side of the property which will have a centralized discharge point outside of the 50 foot um, resource buffer area the change that we had from the plans that were originally submitted to these plans or the revised plans is we had a little patio walkway out back and we removed that and added a bike rack based on planning board comments. Um, the project will clear about um, 19,000 square feet of wooded area on the site to make room for the building. And that's an overview of the project. Oh, um, stormwater to wildwood conservation area should be reduced based on the reduction of stormwater flow north to 57 Olympia, which ends up collecting in the drive and then discharging um, east to the wildwood conservation area. That's a quick overview of it. I don't know, Kyle is also on if he has any other comments, but since we're only doing a quick overview and you have to still review the project in okay. more details. Okay, um, thank you, Mark. Kyle, if you want to be appointed to a panelist, raise your hand. Um, Otherwise, thank you, and we'll take public comment. So if you're here as a member of the public in attendance to 
talk about this proposed project at um, 47 Olympia Drive, please raise your hand. Crickets. Um, yep, I don't see any activity amongst our seven attendees here. Um, so with that, uh, Mark, I appreciate your time introducing us to the project. Um, Aaron, do you wanna pull up the slides so we can make a motion to continue? All right, I'll make a motion to continue the public hearing of 47 Olympic Drive notice of intent to September 28th, 2022 at 755. Second. Andre on the second. Voice vote. Andre. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. Okay. And I'm an aye. All right. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Have we'll a good see. night. Thank you, you too. We'll yeah. see you in a couple of weeks. Yep. Bye. All right. Good job keeping it moving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna um, do my best to move us through this. The remainder okay. is a lot, so I'm gonna yeah. do my best. So, Aaron, do we want to go back to the land use permits that we didn't cover um, quickly, or how, what do you want to do? Up to you. Sure. Um, yeah, and I think we can barrel through those pretty quickly. Um, so, the first um, land use application is from the um, Native Plant Trust, which is formerly the, gosh, I'm not even sure. I thought it was a garden in the woods. Um, they want to do a botanical survey at the Catherine Cole Conservation Area. Um, and I didn't see any issues with what they were proposing to do um, starting um, mid uh, September through the end of September, they want to do some botanical surveys looking at um, vegetation on the property um, out at the Catherine Cole Conservation Area. They, they frequently do um, these surveys and I just let them know that one condition that we've required previously for these plant surveys is that we require that the results be provided back to us so that we can post them on our website. Great, I see no problem with this. Commissioners? Really interested to hear what they find. Yeah. Thorn. Hey, did you have a comment? Maybe they could weigh in on the uh, pollinator um, benefits, I don't know, subjectively. Um, <laughs> if, they, if they were listening to that, maybe they could just <laughs> give a comment. Yeah, right. Um, if the only thing I would add, Jen, is typically, so they've done this off and on for years at a couple of different conservation areas. Typically, they're looking for rare plant communities. Right. So I think it's unlikely that we would want to post this anywhere, you know, on our website um, or share it at a meeting. I, 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 yeah, I think we just need to think through that because they're often. Oh, you mean results? Yeah, results. They're often right. looking for climbing fern. They're looking for rare orchids, et cetera, et cetera. So, right. Yeah, yeah if I, it's not get, appropriate to post. We don't have to post it. We can know. just keep it in our archives. Yeah. Yeah. I think Nothing anything great. that uh, might be sought out for in terms of uh, poaching would be a good idea to uh, keep off the uh, public, um, keep off the public uh, view, if you would. Agreed. Good idea. Thanks, Dave. Um, okay. Let me, let me make a motion to approve the land use for a botanical survey at Catherine Cole Conservation Area. Yes. You're on fire tonight, Fletcher. On oh, fire. I feel it. Do I have a motion? A second. Or no, oh, wait. Sorry. Oh, is there a motion? Is a motion with a motion. With a quest, like rhetorical motion? Just say so moved. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> I okay. ran the layer the other day. Seconded, yeah. seconded. Finally. Laura's on the second. Okay, voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Laura. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. I'm also an aye. 
Okay, and then our other one is for our favorite Mount Pollux um, mm -hmm. for a wedding up there, which is proposed in early November, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. November 5th, um, 25 participants between 3 and 5 p.m. Uh, they want to just put up a temporary sign uh, that would be stuck in the ground. Um, and yeah. That is what is being proposed. I'll do a screen share. Okay. What about parking? Aware that there's mm -hmm. minimal parking. Yeah, I'll definitely make them aware of our sort of standard conditions on Mount Pollux as far as like parking is first come, first serve. You know, it's yeah. open to the public. <laughs> um, we should have know. wedding boilerplate just for yeah. Mount Pollux. So yeah. Is it really yeah, right. only three to five? I mean, are they going to be setting up? Are they going to be like, what is their actual like time use? Um, so they, I don't think are in attendance, but if we have questions that can't be answered tonight, I can ask her to come on the 28th. Um, if you guys feel like you want more detail on the exact specifics of the application. I think as long as they have like, you know, our last whatever meeting about we had the meeting, mount pollock's meeting with the filming and then the, the wedding was right after the other mm -hmm. wedding mm -hmm. i mean we made it very clear i think you're maybe right we should have like a boilerplate for weddings at mount pollock yeah mm -hmm. and i'm um, um so it's just the park and set, set up and break down because 25 people are gonna bring chairs yeah, so like our sort of standard, they should have the permit with them. The parking is first come, first serve. They have to clean up after themselves. If they take put up signage for temporary, they have to take it down. They can't, they don't have exclusive access to the site. The public is still welcome there. Those types of standard conditions is what, what you guys are looking for. If there's anything more specific, I'm happy to add it. So I am just going to be really forthright that I am not in favor of this anymore until we have like a, a more wholesome discussion. I just feel like, I feel like Mount Pollux is so small um, in allowing this stuff. Like we're like, basically we're saying for a Saturday for maybe it's two hours, uh, we're not gonna allow anyone else up there. So I, I don't feel, I mean, I don't feel like if we got wedding applications for every Saturday and Sunday, for the fall, that would be a fair use of public land for our community. And so anyways, um, you know, while I'm inclined to just, you know, I, I feel a little bit badly because it's coming on the heels of just sort of what I experienced up there, which is even smaller than 25 people. Um, so, you know, that's just where I am right now. Yeah, I hear you, Laura. I think um, it would be difficult to reject this application. I, I agree with you. Um, given yeah. what we've approved, but I think we should keep this in mind with the land use policy. And if there's something structurally we want to change about events like this on Mount Pollux, we should use that as a venue to flesh that out. Because I agree with you. I mean, it feels inconsistent. It's like our only conservation land that gets this kind of, it's like uh, basically like we're running a wedding venue without no, running no, a wedding no. venue. No, it's true. Yeah. And uh, are these guys Amherst residents to be asked if they're actually from Amherst? I don't think we can um, do that. No, we can't do that. Yeah. yeah I think we can. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, if I could just chime in, I, I think this has been kind of a conundrum. In fact, when I started here, um, some years ago, there were more weddings than there are now on Mount Pollux, far more weddings. And back, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, uh, what we actually required a fee for Mount Pollux, but the fee went to the Kestrel Trust, and then the Kestrel Trust donated that back to the town because it was hard for the town to accept mm -hmm. a $200 fee or whatever. Interesting. So, you know, I share Laura's concern, you know, coming off of the, the movie experience that you had up there. Um, the flip side of that, and I'll, you know, this is a good conversation for later, is that um, we now, through the, the, the process that has evolved through Beth Wilson and now Aaron's work and, and your work, 
Um, we now have a better handle on what is happening at Mount Pollux, at Amethyst Brook, at Puffer Spawn, et cetera, et cetera, than we ever had before. So to some degree, knowing what, what people's intentions are, I think is a real plus. To be perfectly honest, if somebody wanted to have a 25 person mm -hmm. wedding up there and not tell us, mm -hmm. there's really not a darn thing yeah. that the commission could do about that. As long, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they happen, spontaneous weddings happen mm -hmm. at Mount Pollux, they happen at, we've had them at Puffer's Pond. So, mm -hmm. so they're doing the right thing by contacting us because they're following our process. I think the larger question is, you know, are we prepared to have weddings up there? What are some of the implications for the public? Um, I would add to this one, you know, the number 25 does worry me, worry me a little bit. You know, we always encourage um, um, carpooling and I would, you know, I would almost make it mandatory that people think they they must carpool. And there's, there's adequate parking right down the street at the South Amherst Common that is public and, you know, you could even limit the number of cars they can bring up there so they don't overwhelm the parking lot or the access road. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's a very narrow access road. It was not intended to be for large events. Um, historically, I think they had weddings of 100 people up there with chairs and the whole thing. And it got overwhelming for the department because the expectation would be very, very high. Why is the gate not open? Why is the, why, why is the uh, grass too short or too long? There's ticks, there's poison ivy, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think a larger, a broader conversation on, on the matter makes sense, so. And I'm glad you brought that up, Laura. But I'll uh, approve it tonight, because I agree with you. It'd be yeah, I think we need to work on the land use policy before we change course and mm -hmm. our status quo. But I, I do agree that 25 starts feeling kind of like a lot of trampling and um, people also. Um, I like your idea of having a car limit though, because really, you know, there's sort of an, a, we're saying you don't have exclusive access, but if you take the parking lot, you essentially are having exclusive access. So totally, I, yeah. I feel sort of, you know, that not great about that condition when we give it. No, but yeah. then on the flip side, what Dave's saying is like, we could, I could decide to go take exclusive access by parking our cars for sure. up there, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know they are uh, they are requesting permission, and the permission that we give them can be conditioned on a X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, what happened to Loro is uh, completely unfair, and um, uh, yeah, I, I mean. It, I, I think it makes sense for us to take that experience and uh, set out some policies or some uh, sideboards to uh, what mm. is going to be occurring there in the future to our responses to uh, future uh, requests uh, for permission there. And, um, you know, the ideas that we're hearing here, Michelle's idea of, uh, you know, what to do with the parking. I mean, I could, you know, one of the conditions could be that, uh, you know, that they arrive by a bus. Mm -hmm. um, so that the, you know, and the, on this, I don't want to talk too much, but uh, on this uh, application, it says that, um, you know, there's going to be uh, uh, directing guests uh, where to go and advising others that there's a wedding in progress. I mean, what el what the what's the implication of that? That the implication, uh, you know, are they implying that there's a wedding in process stay away or yes, you know, yeah. that that's what that means. <laughs> that's where I was reading it, but you know, um, it's uh, which is normal for a wedding. You don't want people just crashing your wedding. You know, but normally you pay a fee and it's a yeah, venue. COVID at the last one. Just, yeah. That, crashed. <laughs> that was a different scenario. Yeah. I mean, so, all right. We should probably, uh, we should probably set this as an agenda for the future or something that we pass around. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, I think we've got a lot of other business, like 20 yeah, other business items beyond say, this. So yeah. if, if you guys aren't ready to vote on it or you want more questions, we can talk about it at the next meeting but um if we, you guys like do want to approve next, with I, I would like to talk about it at the next meeting yeah as would i i think that i'm comfortable i am comfortable voting on this application now i think we should 
um, just because we have approved a lot of other similar, very, very, very similar mm -hmm. events up there so far. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, land use meeting uh, uh, permit for Mount Pollux for a 25 person wedding on whatever, what date was it again? Um, November, November 5th. 5th. November 5th. With a boilerplate conditions. Mm -hmm. And could I friendly add to that, which is the strong recommendation that they carpool from South, South uh, Common and that they cannot exclude others from um, walking up to the to the summit of Mount Pollux uh, before, during, or after the, you know, the, the service, the wedding. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll second that. It's a second from Andre. Voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Je uh, Laura. No. <laughs> I'm an I. You got that, Aaron? That was a nay from Laura. The rest are nice. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. Uh, um, um, so, certificates of compliance? Yeah, I think, I think some of these we can bomb through. Um, so, okay. I'm going to um, pull this up. Um, so the two certificates of compliance, completely fine. They are fully stable and uh, constructed probably in the early 90s. So it's more just a, um, administrative to issue them a complete certification. So we need two motions. Or you could do, you could do a single motion with both sites if you, if that's easier. Okay. All right, I'll make a motion to um, uh, complete the cert cert certification of compliance for both 76 Woodlot Road and 182 Wildflower Lane. I'll second it. Andre seconded. Voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Laura. No, Laura. M and I. Um, okay, request for emergency certs. So this is um, this is a site we had a previous violation on, and the owners reached out to us on this. Um, there was uh, one dead tree and two diseased trees on the site. Um, they had an arborist come out and look at them and identify the issue and they requested permission from our office and um, they probably could have removed them without a permit, but um, I, we issued them an emergency cert and I appreciated the fact that they reached out to us. So um, I, if the commission would be willing to ratify that emergency certification. For 286 West Pomeroy. Uh, move to ratify the emergency certification for 286 West Pomeroy Lane. Second. Second. Michelle on the second, or sorry, Fletcher on the second. Um, voice vote, Laura. Aye. Uh, Andre. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And also an aye. Um, okay, so. Um, I wonder, I just want to see if Mickey Marcus is still on the call. Did he leave? He okay. left. I guess yeah. he left. Okay. Um, I think because Mickey's not on the call, could we come back to you, Mass, and do that last? Because I know there's some folks who are waiting um, in the wings for um, at least one uh, of the items in the request for change to order of conditions. Um, and sure. so I just want to be respectful that they're in the waiting room. Of course. Um, and I, I know that um, several folks are here for the um, modification for 11 trillion way, which it says under order of conditions, but it's a determination. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if we could handle that one first, I think that's the most tricky one. So let's get it out of the way if we can. Okay, sure. Um, so just to give you guys some background and, and Dave's familiar with this situation. Um, 
the Conservation Commission received a request for determination, I believe it was last year, for the construction of a single family home. The home itself is completely outside of the 100 foot buffer zone, but the property, um, the outer 50 foot um, buffer from an intermittent stream in BVW is on the property. And as part of the application, the owner, um, his name is Amir Mikchi, had requested to do some tree removal on the slope within the um, outer 50 foot buffer. When the commission issued the determination of applicability, they um, basically said that no trees could be cleared um, on the slope in the buffer. That was like the, the one restrictive condition of the permit that they didn't want to see the trees removed on the slope. Um, Amir, when, so recently Amir approached me um, when I was out doing an inspection at um, the South Amherst, or the uh, Southeast Street Commons property. And he said, I really want to take those trees down in the buffer. Um, and I'm going to get started soon. And I said, well, your permit restricts clearing on the slope. And he, because, it, you know, he filed the permit for it, he, he thought that it had been approved. And I sent the determination along to him to show that the um, commission had basically said he couldn't take the, the trees that were on the slope. So then I know Amir reached out to Dave and Dave met with um, Amir and we sort of tried to work it with him that he would he would mark the trees on the site and then I would go out and look at the trees that he had marked um, and then we would bring it back to the commission for consideration again. Um, I will bear with me just a moment. I'm going to pull up the photos of the trees. Um, from visiting the site, um, the there are approximately 15 trees. Um, they are, um, sorry, I'm trying to close some stuff so I can get to the photos. Um, there are approximately 15 trees. There's a, a total of approximately 30 trees on the entire slope. So it's clearing about half of the trees um, within the buffer zone. Um, the area is, again, it's it's very close to an intermittent stream, the area where the trees would be coming down. They're very large pines. And the best way to describe it is there's a row of oaks, there's a row of pines, and then there's another row of oaks. So these are very large pines that are coming down in between two rows of large oaks. And so I was really concerned that when he felled the trees, it was gonna damage a bunch of the oaks and that we we're gonna end up losing a lot more than 50% of the basal area, basal cover area on that specific location. Um, two of the trees are dead and one of them is nearly dead. Um, so just for the record, um, and I'm going to pull up the photos so that you guys can see the trees that he has marked. So <clears throat> looking down, you can see there are several very large um, pines, and I counted them out as approximately 15. Um, so and you can see there's a couple dead ones in there. There's like Two or there, one of them is still alive, but just barely, but there's like three dead ones. I have no problem with the dead trees coming down because they're hazardous. Um, I, I do have a little bit of an issue with an amendment to a determination where the commission has already made a decision because there is really no recourse for a amendment to a determination. Um, uh, and the other issue is there are many concerned butters who, as you guys might recall, those who were present at the meeting, it's not the commission's jurisdiction, but I do remember the consultant saying during the hearing that there was going to be a privacy buffer of trees preserved on either side of the house lot. And according to the butters, the lot was completely clear cut so that, you know, that statement was false. Um, and they're just very concerned about if, if, the commission approves this, that more trees are going to be taken down than what was identified in the field, um, et cetera. But I don't want to speak for abutters. I think there's several of them that are in attendance tonight. Um, I know one gentleman, um, Nikunj, had asked to do a presentation, uh, Jen, um, a, a brief presentation basically outlining the abutters' concerns with the tree removal. So yeah. that's 
really at your discretion if you want to allow that or not. Okay. Well, let's discuss this briefly as a commission to kind of get a feel here. Um, I would like to hear everyone's thoughts on this. I mean, we reviewed the RDA and specifically conditioned no tree cutting. I don't have any additional information that would cause me to revisit that determination. Um, so without any additional information that would change that original decision, I don't see a reason to allow it. Um, but I would love to hear what you guys think. Was that last picture? I'm sorry. Uh, that last picture was that a seven? Was that a log down or is that uh, was that a um a silt fence? It's a silt fence. It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. I would also. This is reminiscent of you know one Kingman and Tuckerman. You know we have really worked hard to maintain these buffers around intermittent streams as a commission, and it's also part of the law. So um, there's a lot of. I agree, Jen. Yeah. Nothing's changed my opinion about that initial vote on that permit. So I see no reason to change it. What was the, was there a reason why those trees wanted, uh, why, why, why we're looking for an amendment to remove these trees? Yeah, I mean, I think it was the same reason that was originally outlined, which was they wanted a view down to the stream and also prevent, um, because they're so tall, the pines are so tall that they're concerned about shading on the home. They wanted to have a little more sunshine coming in on the house. I mean, if they take those trees out, they're going to get understory in there. And if they don't cut that down, they're going to have less of a view. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm still, I'm still sticking to my original vote on this permit. Yeah, Jen, if I could add, because I did go out and, and walk around with Mr. McChee, and I'm not, I'm not advocating one way or the other for this. I think um, I do agree with Aaron that the three dead trees, um, uh, you know, I, I, I would support removing the three dead trees. The other thing I heard from Mr. McChee, and I think it is a reality, which is, and, and again, Aaron knows the site better than I do, um, but the from a homeowner standpoint, if there are mature white pines toward the top of that hill where you are going to buy, uh, build a new, um, a, a new house. Um, you know, I, I was sympathetic to any concerns about those white pines topping off in the wind because that's what they do. So if, you know, I don't know if there are any white pines near the top of the, the, the slope, Aaron, or were they all down? Um, but that was one of the concerns that you know, was shared with me out in the field. Um, but I don't know the specifics of, you know, I was, I was there for all of, you know, 10 or 12 minutes walking around a couple of weeks ago. So I think Aaron went out and actually looked at which trees were, were marked with uh, green tape. Those trees that you're talking about on the top of the slope, Dave, are those also in the buffer? The ones at the top of the slope aren't in the buffer. The ones, the ones that um, are proposed for removal are further down on the slope. Um, and you can see it sort of in, let me share this photo. Um, they're further down on the slope, like toward the silt fence. So the silt fence is at the 50 foot buffer. So you can see it's- mm. um, Yeah, so that would be inconsistent with kind of a safety, you know, kind of a, you know, safety of the house. It would only be if there's any closer to the top of the hill, the top of the slope. And and I I, I think in this picture the, the the house lot is to the right. Is that right, Aaron? Yeah. Um yeah, so it's actually it's to the right and behind where I was standing. Um, but the the um, hundred foot buffer goes probably um I wanna say it doesn't even go to the top of the slope. So there is some, there's like a crest at the top of the hill. And I do believe that they cleared all the way up to the hundred foot buffer at this point. They sort of clear cut the lot all the way up to the hundred foot buffer. So anything that would be at the top of that slope, I believe has already been removed. Oh, wait, you say, oh. I wish I had turned around These and are, taken a picture. <laughs> These trees are within the hundred foot. These buffer. trees are within the hundred foot buffer. Yes. Um, so that the silt fence is basically at the 50 foot um, and more or less behind where I'm standing is the extent of the 50 foot. So um, the, and the top of the hill 
is outside of 100 feet. So the right. the issues with the you know large mature white pines falling on the house would be, um, I think, not in our jurisdiction. It's well, I think those trees may have already been taken out, but I, um, yeah, it's it's a little tricky because like the, when I look at the silt fence, like I I didn't take a measuring tape, but I pasted it off, and it, it's supposed to be. 50 feet from the stream, but I believe in some places it's closer, like more like 45 or 40 feet from the stream. Um, so, like I said, I didn't take a measuring tape because I was alone out there, but, um, you know, it, the line is a little sort of sketchy as to where it falls on the property. But the the 100 foot doesn't even extend to the top of the hill. There's, it's like mm. the, the um, it extends, I would say, three quarters of the way up the slope and then there's like another quarter at the peak of the slope and then it goes back down towards the road. And Jen, I might suggest, I mean, if if there's no appetite for this, then, you know, from the commission, then it might save time in your agenda to kind of move on it, you know. Yeah. We're certainly respecting the abutters, but if there's no appetite, and again, I, I would, still ask about whether the the dead trees can be removed or not um, um, but, but yeah. if, if there's no movement to amending this then um, why not move on I'm not did, hearing any support for amending it amongst the mm -hmm. commissioners um, I'm not sure how to handle you know, public comments here because we have a very full meeting. If we're not going to amend this RDA, I'm not sure what there is to comment on. What do we do in that situation, Aaron? Um, I say maybe just announce to the abutters that change isn't going to be made and that if um, mm. they have additional concerns that they should raise their hand, but otherwise just okay. going to move on. I mean, you could also say if you could, you know, in two minutes, yeah. Two minutes each or something. Okay. All right. So we have five people in attendance. Um, two people have their hands raised already and have had this them raised this whole time. So um, I would like, again, so if you are here about, um, what's the number on Trillium Way? Um, 11. 11 Trillium Way, um, a request to amend our RDA, um, the conditions on our RDA. Uh, we are not going to permit tree cutting. Um, we are going not. We are not going to amend the RDA. Um, so, if you have additional questions or comments, um, please raise your hand, and we are going to limit that to two minutes. Um, so, Victoria, I see you have your hand raised. I just move Victoria in, she should be. Hi, Victoria. Muted. You can see, okay, so sorry. Um, so first, if you could just identify yourself and your address. Yeah. So I am Victoria Hool. Um, I am, I live at 1165 River Road in Aguam. Um, my company is Wicked Hool Engineering. I used to work for the town of Windsor, Connecticut and also Fuss and O'Neill. So sorry, I like oh, wash my face and stuff while the crickets were, cause it was taking a long time. Um, wasn't expecting to be on video. Um, so I've been working with Amir on the 133 Southeast Street site and he had asked me a number of questions regarding this site and sort of the tree clearing in general. The original permit was, um, a little bit confusing, you know, it was very clear, don't clear within the 50 feet. And then it was, you know, don't clear on just like the slope, but it doesn't define what the slope is, is the slope two to one, is the slope four to one, like it never really defines it. And so he asked me like a lot of times um, what I thought that meant. And in reality, he just really needed to hear it from Aaron so that he felt comfortable. So he reached out to sort of ask that clarification. Um, and he's, you know, building a home, I think the pieces of the dead trees, obviously the dead trees would then possibly hit other trees that could cause some damage. 
he would like more sunlight into the property sort of just from, I mean, they're like nice homes in that area. Um, and I think at the original meeting too, he wasn't 100% really um, understanding maybe what the concerns are. I am empathetic to sort of the causes that you have. I've never seen an agenda like yours before, honestly. <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys review a lot in one meeting. And I'm like, and you have another September meeting. So um, I just feel as though I do think there is um, some validity to revisiting the issue in terms of what the specific trees are, specifically within that 50 to 100 feet buffer, looking at sort of what those critical slopes are. He'd like to cut them, but not remove the stumps so that they're not sort of causing that overall sort of slope destabilization. I think while they are at the bottom of the slope, they're not at slopes maybe greater than two to one. So they're not in that detrimental area. And it's hard when you have a lot of um, neighbors that are really opposed to it, but I feel like some of that tree buffer stuff is really more, under the jurisdiction of like planning and zoning. So if they're within the setbacks and stuff like that, and if it's truly not deemed a slope stabilization issue, um, then could it be reconsidered? So I just think there is some validity to actually maybe looking a little bit more into it. I understand you have a busy agenda and I understand it was weighed in on, but there was some, un, you know, not yeah, Victoria, I, I appreciate your input. Thank you. That's that's more than two minutes. Um, so thank you for being here tonight um, and for your contribution. Um, all right. It looks like there's one more hand raised. Um, Mikunji, how do I pronounce that? Erin, you had it. I think it's Mikunj. We couldn't. Okay. Apologies. I'll get that clarified. We couldn't. Yes. It, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate what you, what you, what you all did. So I don't really have anything much to add except to say clearly that what the previous uh, person mentioned, you know, it, it's very clear what the slope is. You go down there, you see it, it's very steep. Uh, as Erin mentioned, the 50 foot line is pretty much down. There's no, there's absolutely no tree is going to fall on the house. The plot is pretty flat. It's big enough for him to build. There's absolutely no reason for any of the trees to be cut. And, um, you know, our, our houses are built right there. Our neighbor's houses are there too. It's pretty much, you know, I think what you guys did was the right thing. So. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. All right, there is one more hand raised. I would like to say that we are not making any amendments to this RDA. So we are not approving tree cutting. If you still have a question or comment jurisdictional to this situation, please raise your hand. Okay, I think we're good. Thanks for being here, everyone. Um, I know this is a difficult situation. Um, but it sounds like the commission has agreed to stick by our original um, determination on this one. And I did let Amir know he could cut the dead trees, the, the dead ones, but only the dead ones. Yep. Sounds good. Safety issue. Okay. Okay. So do you want to keep rolling? Yeah. Okay. Yes, um, I don't think that any motions are needed for any of these, um, but I, I do want to make you aware of them. Um, and if anybody has concerns, um, let me know. Um, so 29 Mill Lane, they had a, this is a, uh, there was a, uh, it was a permit for a um, tennis court. And there was, in the course of our review, we discovered that there had been a violation. We required them to restore a swale on the site. And also we required them to put in a bridge that met the stream crossing standards for their vehicle access over the stream, which previously just had a piece of um, 
uh, a board basically going over it. So um, we approved a, a, a bridge there. They made some modifications to the bridge. They made it a little more narrow um, and they made it a little bit lower. I did review the plan and I did talk about it with GZA and it does still meet the openness ratio and the bank full requirements. So I don't have any issues with them changing, making the minor change to the plan set. 51 Spalding Street, um, they wanted to sub out um, one tree for another. Both of the trees were native. I didn't think that was a big issue. I just wanted to highlight it for you. But I do also want to let you know that they their plan is going to be changing substantially and pulling away from the wetland because the ZBA permitted them to make the parking area smaller. I think that that'll probably be coming down the line in the next month or two as a minor administrative change as well. But I just wanted to kind of keep that in your radar. Um, I'm just going to jump to Hickory next because I think it's a little bit another easier one before we get hung up on the Eversource. Um, so um, we've approved, I think, three or four minor modifications to the Hickory Ridge order of conditions for the solar project that's being developed by AMP. Recently, we, we have, town staff has been coordinating with AMP pretty substantially to make sure because they're gearing up to get started um, on their work. And one of the things um, that they did was to assess, reassess the bridges because um, a lot of time has passed since 2017 when the original order of conditions was issued and there's been a lot of flooding and changes to the landscape since that time. And so they reassessed the bridges to make sure they were still stable. Um, in doing so, they did discover that the decking on one of the bridges um, is not really adequate for heavy machinery to go over. So they would like to lay a timber timber bridge over the top of it. Um, and they still need to make some other sort of structural repairs to the bridge before that happens. Um, I included it in the folder for you, the correspondence folder. My assessment of that bridge work is that it's not substantially differing from what was already approved by the commission in the original order of conditions. Jen and I did talk offline about this and I think, you know, it's kind of like on the fence in terms of like, okay, change after change after change, when do we draw the line? I don't think drawing the line is here. Um, hopefully this will be the last change, but I just wanted to make you guys aware of it. I don't think it's a substantive change to the original order of conditions, but if anybody feels different based on the content of the email that was sent, um, and I can pull it up if folks want me to, but um, I don't think that there's a significant change in terms of impact to the river, um, excavation that had already been approved, et cetera. Um, so. Yeah. And I just want to say, there. yeah, for my part, I agree with everything Aaron said. Again, we had talked about this offline. It did, you know, those bridges were a big part of the discussion for the original permit, because I specifically was concerned about the structural integrity of those bridges. And if they have to be replaced, it is a major project. Um, so, you know, this it's getting there but i think it's still under the line and can be considered a minor amendment i just emphasized to aaron that we need to be loud and clear that we've had amendment after amendment after amendment to this order of conditions and you know we're getting to a point that we might have to revisit the permit if anything more substantial comes across our collective desk um so i just want you guys to know that we're watching that <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, and then the other update is so the Conservation Commission had approved Eversource to do some um, glossy buckthorn applications in um, rare species habitat along their right of way in a couple of locations one off College Street, one off of um, Strong Street. The commission had asked NHESP to approve their formulation of the um, herbicide that was used, and they did get that approval. And then after um, getting that approval, they found out about this um, buckthorn blaster, which is a, um, it's, it looks kind of like um, an envelope moistener. Um, and they put uh, herbicide in it and they use it as a targeted treatment for um, buckthorn. And they would like to use that method um, as part of this application and sought to get the commission's approval on it. 
I don't think it's a big change from what they had already approved to do. If anything, I think it's more of a direct spot treatment. Again, the, it's in the correspondence folder. I think it's a, um, a more precise method of applying um, the, um, as opposed to using a paintbrush, they use almost like a sponge to dab the top of the, um, the stems. And he did provide some photos of what that looks like. So I don't have any problem with what they're proposing as far as the change. I just wanted to highlight it for the board that that, that um, request did come through. I've used that thing before. They're totally fine. They've been used. A bunch of working groups in Upper Midwest began started with it, and it's just kind of gone from there. I just googled it. It's like available on Amazon, but it looks like it. It's a different chemical. Um, so the and is it an thank you. Method? No, thank you. It's there was a slightly different formulation which they passed by NHESP and NHESP did approve. Um, but yes, a slightly different formulation for the use in that for that specific application as well. If anybody, oops, sorry, if anybody thinks that any of these um, warrants a, a motion to approve, then that's completely fine. I, um, I'll leave it to you guys to render that decision, but um, I think they're all sort of relatively low um, minor changes. So, um, yeah, I, I'd like to know what a glorified bingo marker is. <laughs> Very similar to an envelope moistener. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> I was like wondering, what is he talking about? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You're keeping track of this stuff, Aaron. I, I don't see, it doesn't seem that, um, yeah, these are minor, but I appreciate you um, keeping track of it and letting us know. Yeah, I agree with Fletcher. Yeah, so commissioners are looking for a motion to approve the minor administrative changes at list all of these properties. Yeah, that's a good way to handle it. Not all of them, right? Not trillium. Uh, not, yeah, not right. trillium. Not trillium. Yep. Thanks, Michelle. All right, uh, I'll make a motion to approve um, the changes at 29 Mill Lane, 51 Spalding Street. The uh, Eversource uh, determination that uh, we've made previously, uh, Hickory Ridge dash uh, slash uh, AMP order of conditions, but not 11 trillion way uh, as minor administrative changes. A second. A second from Laura. Voice vote, Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And I'm also an aye. Excellent. Um, UMass, I'm going to just give you guys a quick update on this. Um, for those of you who are not aware, um, on on or around September 1st, I, I became aware that um, UMass was doing some trenching um, on Cold Storage Road in Hadley to connect into the Village Park apartments off of North Pleasant Street. Once I found out about it, I sent a stop work immediately to um, the facilities department at UMass because I had previously been in contact with facilities and knew that they needed a notice of intent for, to complete that trenching work. I sent them the stop work order and I had been in contact with UMass on several occasions to discuss the situation and had been in the process of scheduling a site visit with them. Um, the gentleman who's the manager at the facilities was unable to schedule a site visit with me. And so um, I ended up scheduling the site visit with another person um, from UMass who took me out there. I went out on the 8th of September. So that gives you a, you know, the stop work was issued on the first. I went out on the eighth, and when I went out, walked out on site, there was work actively going on to replace a culvert, which had not been permitted. It was a complete mess. Um, it was two days after the big rainstorm um, following the long um, drought that we've had, and it was very muddy, very messy, um, and the replacement itself was poorly designed. 
the contractor on site did not install the um, environmental controls that were necessary to do the work. And there were three laborers out doing the work. There was no engineer overseeing to make sure that the culverts were placed at appropriate inverts. Um, there was no measurement taken for the riprap that was placed at the inlets and outlets. Um, they had a bypass pump, which was drawing water from a silty pool and dumping it into another culvert, which was approximately 30 feet away, causing scour around that culvert. Um, I issued an enforcement order that day. I talked with Jen prior to issuing the enforcement order. Um, I've also been in touch with the Hadley Conservation Commission, and I've been in touch as well with DEP about the situation. Um, if the commission is willing to ratify the enforcement order tonight, that is what I um, would ask of you. However, Dave and I have also talked at length about this and um, I'm gonna be providing guidance to the applicant's representative, which is SWCA. They were out on site with me following the violation. And what I would like to see, what Dave would like to see is for the two, I think they're 16 inch culverts to be replaced with a crossing that meets the stream crossing standards and for the entire area to be um, restored uh, completely, basically. And then also, if possible, um, there's a 60 inch culvert that's immediately beside this, which um, received a brunt of impact because of the bypass pumping and also it's in terrible shape and really needs to be replaced. I'd love to see that culvert replaced as mitigation for the overall violation. Um, so that will be my ask um, of the applicant. And I think talking with Dave Z, he's in agreement with that. Um, I'd like to see the, the enforcement order ratified and for me to provide that guidance to SWCA and then to have SWCA come back at the meeting on the 28th to discuss sort of their findings, their recommendations um, as they begin to prepare an after the fact notice of intent. And hopefully that notice of intent will be restoring and bringing this situation into compliance and improving the resource area damage that was done. Aaron, so this is, this is, you're talking about from cold storage. So it basically falls the Mill River out, out to where they're building the new presidential, whatever apartments. So that's like where all their construction debris is and stuff. And yeah, all back there. Okay. There's a yeah, 16 inch culvert back there. Okay. Yep. Yep. That culvert doesn't serve the Mill, Miller's uh, Mill River there. No. It's no, it's a unnamed perennial trip that flows into the Mill River though. And mm. it's, it's really sad because it looks like when they installed that road, it basically created like a giant dam essentially going totally. um, between that, it, that perennial dream and the Mill yeah. River. I, I called it intermittent. I apologize. Um, it's perennial, the stream. Um, they're, they, they have basically completely blocked the, right now the perennial stream is blocked. And I would say a 40 to 50 foot section is not flowing right now because of all of the fill, these wow. perched culverts. And they also dropped in like five chunks of granite garbage that they were like, the contractor was probably just looking to dispose of and he just dumped it. They just dumped it in the riverbank. There was a silted in section of the channel. Um, it's, it's a really bad situation. Um, and now all of the water is being forced through this almost failed 60 inch culvert, which is causing a lot of erosion downstream. So I'm happy to make, I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead, Fletcher. I was just happy to make a motion to ratify the enforcement yeah, order. Yeah, of course. Out of curiosity, just quickly, Aaron, what was DEP's response to this? They said if the, if UMass is uncooperative in any capacity to let them know, because they are basically ready to stand behind us. And I think probably jump in with fines um, if necessary so that's I would no man's land back there they just yeah mm. seems like I mean is this is this something that UMass doesn't typically do this do they aren't they pretty good it's it's unusual because we went through this all this effort probably just before you joined the commission Laura to do this kind of right. umbrella NOI process with them yeah, I thought that, it was happening when I was joining that's why it yeah was, yeah, different. and so we have these, we have this very clear understanding with UMass when things, when we have to be notified, when we need to be involved, and when they need to 
like submit a permit application. And this would 100% qualify as something that they would submit an NOI permit application for, no questions. So it's just, it's literally mind boggling um, what, how this got to this point. No man's land back there. Yeah. Yeah, I would, uh, Aaron's done a great job, I'll just add. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I think it's 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 very unusual in the time that I've worked for the town and worked with UMass to have something like this happen. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a complete breakdown of communication, uh, both between and among departments at UMass, but then between those departments and and the conservation department and the commission and staff. So um, they have pledged uh, full cooperation. I think uh, is that accurate, Aaron? They, they've Pledge full cooperation on rectifying the situation, submitting a you know a new NOI, a, an NOI, not a new NOI because there was no NOI, mm -hmm. uh, a notice of intent from right. from the get go to replace you know uh, this culvert or the the two culverts that they put in. So I think this is the first step in in rectifying this situation. So. All right, I'll make a motion to ratify the enforcement order for UMass Cold Storage Road and 950 North Pleasant Street. You have a motion. Laura on the second. Voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Laura. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. I'm also an aye. If I could add one last comment, and that is, I'm sure Aaron's aware of this, and all of us, but time is is not UMass's friend on this on this project, right? So, you know, I, I don't know what they're going to do, how quickly they can get an NOI together, get it before you. There's a lot of engineering to do here. So we'll just have to see. But I, I don't know, Aaron, is your expectation that this could be this could be um, cleaned up, if you will, and a, and a better solution by the time winter sets in, or is this a spring project? It might be a spring project. I tried to get them to button it up as tightly as I could. The contractor on the site, they were not happy, um, and not super responsive, and um, yeah. yeah, but I, you know, I, I, I think- will... Yeah, I will also add, if I could, that, you know, I speak regularly with with some of the leadership team at UMass, and they are, you know, well above people in facilities and, and the contractors. So the leadership at UMass is well aware that this problem happened. They were deeply apologetic and and somewhat embarrassed that this happened. So, um, um, so I think people are aware of this issue at, at many levels and at a very high level at UMass. So hopefully we can get some traction. And if Aaron doesn't get traction from the contractor or or the um, or the team at UMass, then she'll let me know right away. Yes. Thanks, Dave and Aaron, for handling this. I know it's not easy, and I 100% agree, agree with the approach moving forward. Awesome. So I think the CPA appointment is our final article of business tonight. Hopefully I didn't miss anything. I I can't find anything you missed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for checking me. I don't know. I don't know if I'm the best checker, but um yeah, CPA. Who's interested? I'll do it as long as um maybe Fletcher, you can tell me that the meetings don't go on till like 10 p.m. No comment. <laughs> can't um, i was on a different i was on a different meeting uh somebody else uh, was on okay. the meet took, took charge when i was on it was and then when um anna took on it was a, a whole different situation is anna running Better. cpa no but she was she was on a cpa when she was on the con con with us oh, yeah right, anna has right. moved off that's right she's i on, remember she's, she's on town council now but, um, gotcha so sam so. mcleod is the current um chair oh, Sam, oh, he was on when I was on. Yeah, so Sam so grew up. Some yeah, he grew up in Amherst. That's good. Um, his family actually donated some conservation land to the town off of uh, Station Road and Southeast Street. So he has a deep, you know, affiliation so with conservation land. But, you know, it's, I, Michelle, I think it's, 
and I'm a little biased, but it's I think it's one of the most fun committees you can be on. You get to make votes on almost a million dollars in spending every year in the various categories, historic preservation, affordable housing, uh, conservation, open space and recreation. And it's, I mean, it, it should be kind of fun reading the proposals, asking questions, and then learning about the different areas uh, that, that CPA funds, so. And it's just a handful of meetings at first and then it peters out once you mm -hmm. the voting's done. So it's not like consistent like ours. The work is really right. from, from October to February yeah. and, and you're really kind of done. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's vote before I change my mind. <laughs> oh, do we do we vote? Do, is it a motion or a vote? Just motion. I think we probably just need a motion to nominate Michelle to the CPA. I'll make a motion to nominate Michelle to the CPA as a conservation second, liaison. I will I will second that motion. There we go. All right, second from Laura. Voice vote, Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Uh Andre. Aye. And I'm also an aye. Does Michelle vote? Michelle? Aye. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. She just said you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I assume I'll be contacted, et cetera. I'll just wait to hear. Okay. Yeah, Aaron will let let the folks know. Um the CPA is um the liaison is Sonia Aldridge, our comptroller, and Sean Mangano, our finance director. So uh, Aaron can let them know. And then um, also, if you want to chat, you know, offline, Michelle, I could fill you in on kind of how the process goes. And, but um, I will say proposals are due by the end of this month. So uh, there's, there's kind of no rest for the weary. So they'll probably have another meeting coming up in about four to five weeks, uh, maybe six weeks where the proposals would be reviewed. There's typically anywhere from a dozen to as many as 20 proposals in the various categories. And looking at their web, looking at their website is very instructive. So. Stop, Dave. Dave, stop. I think the nomination already happened. <laughs> a million Dave, stop, dollars, man. a million dollars to spend on worthy project. What other committee do you get to do that? There's Jen, no other Jen, mute them. Mute you should them. have been a used car salesman. <laughs> One million dollars. They never go past nine fifty-five. Right. I this feel like I have to move to adjourn. Yeah, right. Here on the Conservation Commission, we have the satisfaction of protecting our wetlands. Just want to defend that. Right. All right. It is good. You'll it, you'll you'll appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Uh, um, sure. So I think that's a wrap on the agenda. Thank you, Aaron and Dave. Sorry, you guys have to be doing this until 942 at night. Um, so we need a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn at 942. I second that motion. But we had a simultaneous second between Andre and Laura. Everyone. <laughs> okay, voice vote, Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm also an aye. All right. You guys are awesome. Thanks, everyone. Right. Uh, thank you guys so much. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Thanks all. This is great. <laughs> <laughs>